Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 163 of Mythos Busters. We're coming to you live, well, I guess we're live here. You won't be live when you listen to it, though, so that was a silly thing to say. I'm Sean. Uh, this is Scott. Hi. And we're your skeleton crew for the evening. Uh, so you may have noticed that we didn't put up an episode in February, and and I'm so sorry if it caused you any uh, stomach acid, but we're here. Uh, it It's just come up that it's been a little bit of a rough go for scheduling at the Mythos Busters offices, as you'll see, like, even even this week, we could, <laughs> we could only get two of us. Yeah. But we, we just had to get together because Hemlock just dropped, guys. Hemlock just dropped. It's mm-hmm. so exciting. And uh, we, we had to get at least one episode out, uh, kind of in the freshness of it. Let's see, Scott, at the top of the episode here, mm-hmm. I want to uh, uh, take, since, since we, it's just the two of us and it's yeah. not the normal crew, uh, I kind of want to ask what you've been playing lately, because we don't, we don't do that segment every time now. No, we don't. Um, so I've been messing around with the new Hemlock stuff, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're... I'm sure people are very familiar with my opinion on Bless and Curse and which one I like and which one I do not think is worth it. I must say that Hemlock has turned me around on Curse. And Ooh, we yeah, love that. We love I'm that. Start and dabble, um, but specifically in Blurs. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, Parallel Wendy is a one I'm kind of bringing back and seeing what I can sure. do to mess around. Cause like there's so many new cards that make her blur style just 10 times better. Um, mm-hmm. Cause I, I used to run her just bless cause that was amazing. But blurs now is, is really sweet. Uh, Kohaku, the, the new guy from mm-hmm. Hemlock. Um, I am still trying to figure him out, but I mean, such an adventure trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, big same oh yeah yeah I think there's a lot of options there um, and Kate as well I'm trying to figure out and I I'm trying to do a really weird build with her where it's it's one of those no matter how much I pass or fail by something else happens mm-hmm. oh that's so, interesting yeah cool. uh, as far as campaigns I've just been doing uh, I like a return to Dunwich as a neat little test campaign, as well as the the Dream Eaters. But I've kind of just been doing some standalones. Uh, I do Midnight Masks a lot standalone to kind of try out a set. Or try out a deck, sorry. But, it's a de- decent deck litmus test, right? Like, that's, that's yeah. pretty classic. Yeah. What have you been doing? I, um... Well, okay, so first first things first, let's talk. Uh, we'll mention it shortly later when we do our, our content wrap-up. But I mm-hmm. did finally finish, uh, and I'll say we because you were on it for, like, the majority uh, of it yeah, with yeah. me, uh, <laughs> it, uh, our playing alone together's mm-hmm. first campaign through uh, through the Dream Eater cycle, cycle as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, it, it one scenario went one way, and the other scenario went the other way. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was a wild ride, and those were uh, really fun games for that campaign, and and I'm really happy with how it went. I don't think I'll play that Duke deck solo again. Hmm. Might, uh, I might I tweak think, it out a little. I think it has potential. I really yeah. do. I, I think the bones of it are really good, and the idea behind it is really good, and I think we could totally do a little mini thing on like taking lessons learned and adjust the base and then adjust the the upgrade path because i don't think it's bad but no i don't think it's bad i just think it the thing that i continually learn when i play solo because you know everyone knows i'm I'm kind of primarily multiplayer guy uh when i play true solo i learned that the builds that i like tend to be too slow for true solo like i i kind of like the the builds where you get some assets down before you're really up and going obviously i play Mm. mystic um but even outside of Mystic, I find myself often playing that way. And that, that is just kind of a, um, a play style adjustment that I have to make on top of everything else. And that Duke deck, I think, is just a good example. Like, the, like you said, the bones are good. The theory's mm-hmm. good. It had a couple games where it really did pop off and work. Mm-hmm. Um, 
just to remind everyone, that deck was very specifically Duke uh, trying to make the hand assets from the Scarlet Keys, the Sickle and the Dowsing Rod, work really well and using uh, Ashcan, uh, Ashcan Pete's ability to ready them and, mm -hmm. and actually try to get some more, um, some more juice out of that squeeze. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it had a couple of games where it popped off, but ultimately it, it was a little on the slow side. So, yeah, no, I'd, I would definitely be interested in going back and kind of debriefing and seeing what we change because, I don't know, yeah. I, I liked it. It was It's a fun deck. Mm -hmm. So. And your your uh, your Monty deck just screamed. <laughs> yes, just my, my, my Green Goblin Jack deck just... Motored. That just that thing goes. I still don't think I've ever had a faster game than that uh, Dark Side of the Moon playthrough that we did. Oh my goodness! I had whiplash from that. It was unbelievably fast. The sound like waves if, are still reverberating. If anyone's gonna watch that, make sure you put your seatbelt on before you do. It's <laughs> it's a wild ride. And even the the uh, the final scenario on the dream side, I thought was, I think a perfect case example of how solo like every little action that you can save or or squeak out or like little efficiencies and stuff can matter in the end um mm -hmm. and how that a scenario can absolutely just try to dumpster you and <laughs> you sometimes you got to make tough decisions take an attack of opportunity because there's it's more opportunity than attack um yeah <laughs> just to to squeeze out whatever you got to do to get out of that situation and mm -hmm. and oh it just give your oh. pound of flesh and get get on with your life yeah it was that was a great game so yeah and and i'm really glad in that particular moment that you were there with me and i was not playing that one true solo true solo on mm. stream because y'all know i'm I'm a little bit of a salty bitch sometimes. It's just, just in my nature. And yeah. that, like, third enemy that hopped out mm -hmm. uh, during Mythos after I was already, after I had tentacled and evade to try to get away, and, like, it was just, like, ugh, I might have, like, spiritually given up if I didn't have someone else mm -hmm. on stream with me in that moment. And I'm glad we didn't. Obviously, I'm glad we didn't. We pulled it out. Uh, Jack rode one health through, like, 80% of that scenario. <laughs> Yeah, that and one was wild. you got wild. the W, so. <laughs> I remember even when, when you pulled uh, Janae off the top of your deck, and uh -huh. uh, you're like, oh, should I, you know, should we get her down? I'm like, yes, only because she has health. Like, <laughs> yep. forget <laughs> just, everything just else. the insurance. She has damage capacity. <laughs> so anyway, those, those were really fun games. So that's, you know, I am still warming up to True Solo. My salty nature does make it a little hard to deal with how brutally swingy uh that that mode can be mm -hmm. having other players at the table really smooths out a lot of um i don't know I, I, like there has to be a term that someone smarter than me has come up with for like when the encounter randomness just really hammers your weakness mm. surely so if someone has come up with the term let let us know um but it that your is weak spot. yeah it's just it goes all paris on your heel mm-hmm and go with that so sure. <laughs> yeah but but and that that is the beauty of playing alone together and that is why i engineered it that way because i get really salty i get defeated way faster than i should mm -hmm. and having that other person uh on stream with me keeps my head on straight better than i would be able to do alone i so. think i think one of the things for for true solo is uh, a mentality I don't want to say you have to have, but it's really beneficial to have where it's like you you look at where you are and even if it's dire, you have to say, okay, what are my outs? Like, what can I do? Yeah. Where's that line I can play that puts me towards victory? And you just have to find it and try it. And if it fails, then it fails and you would have failed, but not to mm -hmm. give up before you've exhausted through that line. And sometimes that line is very difficult to see or figure out. Yes. But Agree, fully agree. Yeah. So anyway, those were really fun games. Yeah. Um, I think we want to do some other stuff with our Twitch streams before we start up another campaign. You and I were bouncing around some ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see what comes out there when we get to streaming again. Um, and then beyond that, of course, Hemlock dropped. So Justin and I did our annual Iron Man face check, which 
is a whole nother level of brutal from Iron Man. <laughs> Uh, and, and that it went well, it went well. Um, I don't want to like, we're, we're going to talk about Hemlock investigator cards in this episode. I suppose I haven't mentioned yet. That was bad of me. Uh, we're going to talk about Hemlock investigator cards. We're going to do very, very non-spoilery impressions of Hemlock from me right here. Just as a quick warning, if you don't want to hear anything, maybe skip ahead two, three minutes. But anyway, uh, yeah, we had a really good time. Um, I do think that there is a lot of punishment for investigators that can't pass an honest agility test in that campaign. It might have just been the path that we took, mm. uh, but but I have to say, like halfway through the campaign, I was like, "Do they want me to play Kohaku, or is this were they baiting me? <laughs> this is this is I feel baited." Yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, no, we had a really good time. We made it through to the end. Ultimately, we didn't get like a, a W. We we got to like the last part of the last scenario and just kind of got overwhelmed. Um, and per usual, Justin was dragging my ass across the line. We played for eighteen hours. I want to say Oof. IRL. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Because on top of what you're already into, uh, uh, what you're already buying into by doing an Iron Man of a campaign that's been out. You know you've played, you've practiced, and you've planned. Mm -hmm. That's enough, right? Iron Manning a campaign that you do not know, have to read, mm -hmm. have to make choices, yep. have to check rules, have to, like, just, you know, all the extra things that you have to do your first time through. It is a... Planning out turns, even? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, I wouldn't trade it for the world, though. We're going to do it every time, but whew, it is, it mm -hmm. is a gauntlet. It is a crucible. Um, so yeah, no, anyway, I had a really good time with it and, uh, very excited to actually like dive back in all of my spare Arkham energy right now is going toward dissonant voices. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm excited because I'm not going to play Hemlock again until I'm done with it. So by the time I get back to Hemlock, I'm going to know all the things again, like I mm. did with, with Scarlet Keys. Right. And well, again, I'm not going to recommend anyone read a campaign guide cover to cover <laughs> i wouldn't exactly call it the way to do it if you really want to know everything it can be a, a, an interesting experiment to just kind of do that and then when you hit something you don't understand or, you, or you're like oh where does this trigger come from like then kind of try to go dig for it like um kind of seeing all the pieces through dissonant voices really so far every time i've done it uh has has changed my perspective on the campaign and it's made Iron Man planning a hell of a lot easier, so. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cool, cool. Well, um, hopefully I'll be able to get done with that and, and have some actual Arkham that I've played by the time we record again, but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we will see. I mean, While... it's slightly shorter than Scarlet Keys. Yep, <laughs> it is slightly shorter than Scarlet Keys, but it's got a lot of small single entries. So, like, mm. the recording time is shorter, but the editing time is more fiddly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. We'll see. We're, we're two, th two and a half entries in at this point, so we're just going to plug away at it till the whole thing's done. Nice. Exciting stuff. Um, okay, so, moving on. We don't have any voicemails to catch up on, regrettably. Guys, mm -hmm. Come on. we want to hear from you. Why, why are you not calling us? I just... Did we do something? Did did we upset you last time? <laughs> Big Tell Kahuna, us about it, please. Big Kahuna says that he, he almost sent in a, a voicemail. So, Big Kahuna, it's on you to send in one. As well as <laughs> everyone else listening. Everyone sent at least one voicemail. I mean, please, Big Kahuna, call <laughs> in. But also, Big Kahuna has like done a lot of heavy lifting in the voicemail True. categories. True. <laughs> voicemail. I don't know. I don't know what word I just said. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, please tell us what's wrong. We want to hear from you. 203-493-6984. We'd love to hear spoiler-free first impressions of Hemlock Vale, uh, whether it be the campaign or cards, cool new deck build ideas that you have for the new Gators and all the new player cards. Please, call. We love you. And My favorite you know. deck ideas to hear are ones that like bring back a card that was kind of panned from like mm -hmm. Dunwich or Forgotten Age or Kirkwood. Like, you know, a, an old card. And... Mm -hmm. It just something in this expansion just gives it new life. So yep. those are ones I love to hear about. Well, 
Let me tell you about persuasion, my friend. <laughs> <'Cause> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just Alessandra. It was also the buff it got from the taboo. But that has become like an S tier level zero card, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. Is oh, that Alessandra? Yeah. Oh, Duke, Duke is in chat and said the word count was about two thirds of the Scarlet Keys, actually. Okay. Yeah, Ooh. I feel that. I feel that. Okay. And it, like, the thing is, is like it's tough to compare them in in some like qualitative way because the structure is so different. But like it flows so well, and like the the structure is super. Like I, I was a pretty big fan of Majora's Mask back in the day, and it gave me very very heavy Majora's Mask uh, vibes on on kind of how time flows. Mm. All right, uh, Scott, what's going on with our patrons? Patrons, uh, we are changing our format a bit. So what we are going to is a one audio podcast per month. And because we have that extra free time of only doing one episode instead of two, we are planning to do a ton of other streaming things or other activities, stuff we want to do uh, to get more connected with the community and produce more content of different things. Uh, Stuff we put out recently, we got the meme stream, which was always a blast. Uh, oh, yeah. Like you said, playing alone together, just finished up that campaign. Uh, you and I have plans for some other Twitch stuff, including maybe getting back to TF, oh, TNA? TNA. Yeah. Today, night slash noonish Arkham. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that's what we'll be doing going forward. Uh, we want to thank our board members, of course. Chris B, Chris H, Chris Sem, our conglomeration of Chris's. Morton, Jared, Ian, Philip, Patrick, Abilio, Jesse, Chad, Robert, and Walker. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. And a special shout out to a random patron is Luis Suarez. Thank you, Luis. We appreciate all of you. Yeah. And everyone who we haven't mentioned. Any support at all. We, honestly, it, it just makes my heart glow with warmness it feels great uh we had a couple of new hires right we do have a couple new hires yeah um we have dennis blackmire uh dennis comes uh from a long history of his family uh of mask uh purveyors so he is actually now the official purveyor of wooden masks and wooden mask accessories Also, if I wanted to add like the little the little uh, like tokens and bling that you put in Crocs, I could put that on on one of the one of the masks. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You have to have at least uh, was it twenty three pieces of of flair <laughs> on your mask. <laughs> I have such a love hate relationship with Office Space because it became my life at some point. <laughs> um, Oh, God. So, so speaking of, joining the office this week as well is Kelly Murphy, who, now that we're headed into Hemlock, is going to be taking on the role of lead QA on mutated fungi foraging. Mm. Luckily, it's it's usually pretty easy at night uh, as they glow. Oh. Sorry. Spoiler alert for Hemlock. <laughs> oh, is there the mushrooms? Mu- the, mu- the mushrooms are weird. Oh, oh. All right. As opposed to normal mushrooms, I, I, I'm walking myself into a corner here. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis and Kelly, for your support. Uh, one last thing I want to shout out is mythosmerch.com. Uh, if you mm-hmm. want to check out any of our merch, we've got shirts, we've got cups, we've got bags, we've got posters, blankets, tons of stuff. Um, if you've all, Also, if you've ever purchased or wanted any of the swag that we have offer, uh, please send us pictures or share pictures with us. We'd love to see it. Uh, yeah. You can check it out, mythosmerch.com. Lovely. All right, so let's hop to a little bit of news. Mm -hmm. Um, So, obviously, Hemlock is out. Yeah. It's out most places. Hopefully, by the time this gets edited and posted, everyone who wants it can can get it. Um, I know Canada and, and like, the UK had a little bit of trouble with the campaign. Or maybe it was just America got it early. Um, no, I, I think it came out on time in America. It, it Canada is lagging way behind on the campaign. Mm, okay. Got the investigator cards, but the campaign is is sorely missed. Oh, so you do not have the campaign yet? No. Oh, I missed Some, that subtext. It, it, okay. it was late, 
And then also some stores got it and some didn't after also being late. Like my store mm. that I usually go to, they're still on like waiting for theirs to come in. So interesting. So just distributor issues, I assume. I can only assume that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that is pure speculation. Yeah, it's sounding like it's going to be very soon though. So I'm very excited. But excellent, mm. excellent. Well, then next episode we'll have to we'll have to give slightly more spoilery thoughts, possibly. Hmm. Um, as well, it's not technically Arkham news anymore, but like, you know, it is still Arkham news. Um, mm-hmm. one Maxine J. Newman, uh, announced on her Twitter that she will actually be leaving or has left, I think at this point, uh, FFG, which was, which was kind of a big thing. Mm-hmm. It kind of, kind of came out of nowhere and, and I'm, I'm very happy for her. She will be sorely missed. Damn, she's going to, yeah, I suppose this is this bears mentioning. Uh, mm-hmm. She announced that she'll be going to Earthborn Games. So the developer who has most recently put out, it might be their only property at the moment, the, the Earthborn is. Rangers game. Yep. That, that kind of, yeah, we haven't talked about it a whole lot on this podcast, but um, I know that's definitely of interest to, to people in, in the Arkham sphere. So Apparently she's going to work on uh, on Earthborn Rangers, so great. I get to buy another game. Yeah, I mean, and here's <laughs> the thing: like, Earthborn Games isn't like two of them like ex FFG designers slash managers. Like, yeah, I think I think the the Andrew? I think it was Andrew Navarro. Yeah, was was uh, head of studio at FFG before he left, or creative director, or something something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Maxine leaving FFG to go to a place where she's going to be designing for a story-driven card game. I mean, I can't think of a better place for her. <laughs> really. Yes, yes. Like, what a what a place to go. So mm-hmm. sad for and, FFG, and I was, but man, I Earthborn. was so successfully uh, putting off getting into Earthborn Rangers, and now it's just <sighs> now I just yeah. gotta Earthborn Rangers, uh, Earthborn Games really picked up a ringer. So. So we wish, obviously, the best of luck to her. Yeah. And uh, and her future endeavors. And who knows? Maybe someday on Tentacle Time, I'll be giving a rave review to Earthborn Rangers. We will see. Yeah. I'm excited to see what she does. Yeah. Over there. Excellent. Uh, then the last thing is just a quick reminder. We have announced the dates for BusterCon 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> it's going to be September French is 9th. impeccable. Amazing <laughs> Thank French. you. Yeah, that was incredible. We <laughs> we. Oui, oui. Um, so that's going to be September 19th through the 22nd, and that is again going to be in the Game Center at Roseville, or sorry, at the Game Center in Roseville, Minnesota. My prepositions are all out of whack tonight. Um, we've got a room block at the DoubleTree Inn, which is right across the way. It's a single, or is it two co- soccer ball kicks away? Where did we land on? That? Uh, it it's more of a three. I, I think two professional soccer players soccer ball kicks away. Yes, How about that? Got it. Got it. So it's very close, walking distance. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got a room block there. Just ask for BusterCon. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll be getting more details up on the website sometime soon. But just go ahead and save that date. Grab that hotel if you want to. Yeah, we know that um, for some people traveling internationally or any travel at all or booking vacation with work, we just mm-hmm. want to give you guys as much early notice as possible. So. Very exciting. Very exciting. We've got we've got the rumblings and some very cool stuff that, that we're going to bring to BusterCon, too. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Excellent. Scott. Yeah. Is it time? <laughs> it's time for you to get fat. <laughs> so every time an FAQ drops, I just add another sound effect to this stinger. And it's getting absolutely obnoxious at this point, and I I love it. It's I try to, I try to channel my inner shock DJ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big kahuna. I hate that stick sting while driving. It gives me a heart attack every time. My job here is done. Then, um, <laughs> so, Scott, fact me. Well, we got a fact. Um, Sometimes my, my favorite time of the year, I'm, I'm very uh, interested in rules and stuff like that, so I love to see changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll go over some of the errata and rulings and stuff like this. This is actually not a huge 
uh, Arata we were talking before the show, like the taboo is quite small. I think it's a minor adjustment just for Hemlock coming out, and I absolutely love it. Cool. Uh, so a couple campaign Arata uh, minor fix, fixes to a couple setups. Uh, there's two for Hemlock regarding when you can play the night scenarios. Just go take a look when you're playing Hemlock. So regarding signature cards, if a game effect would force you, because you know how you can't have someone else's signature event or asset or whatever, so you can't teamwork it to somebody else. Regrettably, but, yes. Yeah. But if a game effect would force you to take a signature card from someone else, that signature card is discarded instead. So whether that's from in play or in your hand or whatnot, um, Got <laughs> even even the game can't force you to that take was... it. About to say so, like the game has just gotten to the point of just like no, slap it out of your hands yeah. every time, any time. Exactly, it it is soul bound to you. <laughs> uh, there's a little a little thing about Kate Winth Winthrop or Winthrop. Winthrop. Okay, not the, not the not the dog one. Winthrop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, but you know what? Kate Winthrop came out first, and now that's stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> So Kate can put clues on cards, uh, and it was just clarifying when an investigator has a card with clues on it uh, that they put there, uh, they can still spend those like normal, like to advance the agenda. Like they're still under your control for for clue purposes. Correct, yeah. Yeah, Um, And if the asset goes away, the clues just drop onto your location. Okay. And then... There's a bit of clarification about the permanent keyword. So a card with the permanent keyword cannot leave its controller player play area unless directed to by scenario card effects. Cards with the permanent keyword cannot be attached to other cards in investigator's play area. Investigators cannot take control, take control of another investigator's permanent cards. Um, an example given is you cannot attach Sin Eater, which is a permanent card, uh, to Ellie Rubash, even if it has a Doom on it, because that would be it not being in play in your play area right oh really so so like even within car cards within your own play area can't do that either mm-hmm. and, okay i mean that makes sense yeah. the permanent yeah. cards are just like printed on the table basically yeah like a tie them to a brick mm-hmm. um this one will be interesting for you sean for your patrice deck if a dilemma is drawn in a skill test <laughs> Finish the entire test, then resolve the dilemma. Okay. Love so. that. That's very consistent with like prior like quick thinking and Yeah. There's like one other ruling that I remember vaguely that's similar, but yeah. Yeah. It just cool. I feel like that makes it really easy, doesn't give give us these weird corner cases and stuff and like yeah. then you're not gonna see like a weird nested skill test again. Yeah. It just it makes action sense. within a skill test, which is what uh, oh god, I play it all the time, and I like I'm starting to lose my grasp on Quick every thinking? no 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 the um at a crossroads uh, the dilemma oh, that lets yes, you yes. the the best dilemma it's the best dilemma that lets <laughs> you either discard a card to get an action or lose an action to draw three cards. Mm. It's so yeah, good. that's fantastic. I think it is the best one. Yes. Uh, lastly, on your own level three, you know that there is the, the regular version. And I was about to say the exceptional one or the regular one. And there's the on your own level three exceptional. Did you know you can upgrade from the regular one to the exceptional one using three XP? So you can go well, from I regular. Mean, yeah, to... Okay. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. That, that follows the same logic. We just. I like it. I don't know if we've ever seen that like work that way with exceptional before. Do we have any cards that are equal level and same name and same name decks? and ones exceptional with no that? extra subtitle? Like there are ones that have like different subtitles with yeah. like the the researched um, assets and stuff, but I don't. Nothing's coming to mind. Yeah. Anyways, so that's a yeah. fun one. Cool. And that's it for, like, errata and changes and stuff that, that are, are major ones that I saw that are, are worthy of of talking. Of course, I encourage everyone to skim through it, find the red text, see what changed. And they did also replace all of the art with hemlock art, so that's all new and nice and refreshed. Yeah, so you'll have to reprint your color copy to be up to date. Oh, my god, that Akachi art on Morningstar is so fire. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Mm-hmm. 
That'd be a great playmat. Yes, it would. That would be a fantastic playmat. Mm-hmm. You hear that, Duke? Anyways. Um, <laughs> if anyone's looking for a late birthday present. Yeah. <laughs> so, Taboo. Small one this time. Okay. We have Scavenging. Both copies uh, got chained for 2 XP. Okay. So, Scavenging level 0 went to 2 XP, and then level 2 went to 4. I guess Graveyard Recursion, or Discard Recursion, is uh, powerful in games. Sean, it I don't know is. if you're aware of that. It is, and mm-hmm. I don't disagree. I am curious what precipitated that change now. Because those, like, Scavenging Level Zero has been out forever. and <laughs> Since the beginning, you know, yeah. Yeah, and, like, Scavenging Level 2 has been out since Dream Eater, so that's existed in the, the pool for a while. Did we get a bunch of, like fast item assets or something that 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 we're afraid I mean, of? the upgraded fire axe okay it is fast yeah i'm not i'm not i also am not sure what precipitated it okay. um unless it was just the prevalence of recursion decks yeah sure I, but I mean, it is it is a very fun and powerful uh, way to go so yeah i'm not sure how i feel about the scavenging level zero going to level two i can see scavenging level two going to four because the level two version being able to play that asset is quite powerful i think yes agree so i don't know if four i feel like it should maybe go into three like maybe just both chain them by one but we'll see yeah yeah i mean it's it's fine yeah okay big kahuna says i assume daryl that's probably the best assumption especially since daryl like also kind of does the bring difficulty down to zero at the same time yeah now I want to play a non-taboo Daryl deck to see. I never really did scavenging with him. Hmm. No, yeah, I me to. neither. I just, I just, I when I, I've only played one campaign with him, and I just threw in all of the new cards from Scarlet Keys. You know, maybe I'll play a campaign with him with scavenging, like the old scavenging before it got tabooed, and I'll <laughs> see come how back problematic it is. <laughs> yeah. Next episode, I'll come back and be like, no, no, I get it, I get it. It's <laughs> yeah, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. So the upgraded key ring went up by 1 XP to 4. Ooh. So instead of 3 XP, it went to 4. Um, yeah, I mean... It's well, I assume that's implicated in whatever it is that scavenging is has allegedly done. <sighs> yeah, that's you're probably right. That seems that definitely seems like if we're talking about abusive Daryl decks, like I'd be looking at those cards very first. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I can, I, I mean, that card is very strong. Um, minus two shroud, three keys. Yes, yeah, so you're guaranteed basically uh, three clues for sure. And if you can knock this test down to zero, you discover mm-hmm. an additional clue. So two clues. It's a very good card. Yeah. And for one call. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's pretty good. I I understand that one. It's kind of funny, though, because if you think about the uh, the last... It might not even been the last taboo. It might have been the one before that. But like, shed a light got hit. Like, mm-hmm. everything everything about Daryl is signaling that that man is is very powerful. Yeah, I I think I got to give him another run around the block, mm-hmm. and maybe be less themey, or like less fun stuff, and more just yeah. like, hey, how can I break this? Exactly. Uh, I will start with scavenging an old key ring. Apparently, quick aside. Quick mm. aside. Yeah. That brings up a question. Mm-hmm. When a new campaign and or new player cards drop, mm-hmm. what do you, when you actually go to play and you're not just like fucking around with cards, when you actually mm-hmm. go to like play a campaign with new stuff in hand, mm-hmm. do you generally try to like use as much of the new stuff as possible or do you kind of like cherry pick and be like, ooh, this would fit this deck type or this does this, but like these are the uh, best cards for that deck? Like where do you fall on that? Well, Continuum. you know how. Like, when an investigator comes out, usually, like, half the box of, of the cards that they can take are made for them, almost, or, mm-hmm. or it feels like it. Or, like, 50% if you're Alessandra. Yeah, right? Like, yeah. It, it, <laughs> something like that. It, it, it's a significant amount. Like, for Alessandra, I basically, like, searched every card that said parlay on it, and I just of course. smashed them all in, right? And then I'm like, sure. I guess I gotta cut a few, you know, a few cards to fit in of some basic skills and stuff. Um so I tend to just run headlong into whatever that investigator's theme is. And so it's usually like 15 to 18 new cards. And then 
some cards from, you know, previous expansions that fit, like Persuasion. And then mm-hmm. I guess I, I try to make sure I at least put in, like, four basic skills just to, like, you know, have skills. Because when I when I do that, I tend to have very few skills. And I, I know I need more skills in the deck. Mm-hmm. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very similar. I'm very mm-hmm. similar. Like, my thing is I just want to try out all the new toys. Mm-hmm. So even if I actively recognize, like, oh, well, I'm playing Kohaku... There's probably a better option than the the Wicked Athame. But I'm still going to play the Wicked Athame because yeah. I just want to try it. Yep. So well, It's like my Parallel Zoe deck started off as like I literally just searched for every Bless card I could. <laughs> right, right. And just, just smashed it all in. And then after a couple of games, I'm like, okay, okay. I got I to gotta trim a few of these and just put in like, you know, overpower and <laughs> you know, basic stuff. So, yeah. Well, in case in point, like, you know, obviously my first time through Hemlock was Kohaku. Mm -hmm. I'll say it. I'm not afraid. If Paradoxical Covenant wasn't what you were aiming at with your first Kohaku build, you're a coward. (laughs) I'll say it. I mean, that's where I went, so. (laughs) You gotta. He's the first one where you're like, this might work. Yeah. Yeah. I recognize that the other ones are probably better, but... (laughs) But that's not what I want to do right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I just want to see both colors. I'll tell you what. All right. Pro tip. Pro tip for yep. Kohaku. In Hemlock specifically, during your preludes, go get your signature tome. There's one location that like lets you do that. Go do that every time. Because playing Kohaku with his signature asset in play is a whole different game mm. to not having it. He's one of those investigators. One of the the, the Diana investigators. Mm-hmm. No, the Daisy. Daisy ones. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Big Kahuna. I was going to go with Ancient Covenant myself. I mean, by all means, go with Ancient Covenant. Just accept the fact that you're a coward. It's fine. <laughs> Ancient Covenant is the best covenant. It is. Can we agree with that? Yes. Yes. Um, but I also... But I, I totally get you, Sean, because that's what I'm going with. Also, the paradoxical. I'm like, well, I have to. It's, it's I just want to see it work. Yeah. And we got upgraded <laughs> Olive, so like. <laughs> yeah. Big Kahuna. I'm a coward and accept my fate. You know what? <laughs> fair. Entirely fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, further decks of mine of uh, kind of will be will be Ancient Covenant, I think. Mm-hmm. Although, I don't yeah. know. He's so fun to play with. Anyways, okay. Let's get back to yeah. Taboo. Because um, we're going to talk about him later. Uh, Payday got a slight wording change. So it used to say gain one resource for each action you perform this turn. Now it says gain one resource for each action you spent this turn. And I want to thank uh, Lord of Ravens on Discord for helping me kind of parse this out. So Yeah, what's the difference? So it works positively in some ways and, and negatively in others. Uh, basically the uh, Zappy Boy bold keyword actions count for non-taboo but they don't they no longer count for taboo because it's a, a zappy boy you're not spending an action so like if you eon sharded correct yes the, the action you took off the ability in eon shard does not count toward payday right it used to anymore anymore yeah. got yeah. it got it um the double action fight or like a triple action um sledgehammer uh counts as performing or taking a single action Ooh. without the taboo Mm-hmm. With the taboo, it now counts as, like, two actions. So even, like, the oh, double okay. action weakness removals, that now mm-hmm. counts as two actions for payday. Okay. Yeah, because you're still spending two. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Uh, yeah. The wording's working for me so far. Yeah. So it's basically, honestly, I, I feel like this makes it make a bit more sense. It's how many arrows did you spend or mm-hmm. actions did you do? Yeah. Now, it makes more sense. Does it make it better? Hmm. Not sure. Oh, clarifying though, sorry, Eon Chart, the take an action thing, Mm -hmm. did not count before or after. Got it. Yeah. After. I I feel like this just makes it just way clearer. It's just, how many arrows did you do or basic actions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I still have it in my head someday when I'm feeling really spicy to go figure out who is the best candidate for that like borrowed time kamehameha Mm. all of your actions for the game into like two or three turns yeah build (laughs) payday for 12 
<laughs> yeah. Well, not just a payday for 12, but yeah, this fits in too. But yeah, so it, it might be Skids. Skids is where I got the idea because MJ showed up to uh, some meetup. It might have been a Gen Con uh, game with this wacky borrowed time Skids deck. And mm. ever since, I'm just like, oh man, how far could you stretch that? Well, your your dream deck just got another awesome neutral card in this box, so. With bide oh, yeah, time. truly, truly, with the, the skill card one. Uh, no, Bide Your Time. Oh, you're totally right, the event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about that one later, because that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's it for Taboo. One thing we forgot to mention, though, on our previous FAQ uh, episode, in the previous FAQ, the Dunwich, Dunwich Permanent Talents got taken off the, the Taboo list. Higher all ed, streetwise, it? higher ed, streetwise, scrapper. They're all back to normal. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, higher ed's still just as good as it always was, right? I I think so. I don't I don't see how that card ever declines in value. But yeah, I mean, now that yeah. we've all gotten used to not like taking them all the time for three XP, like sure. Mm -hmm. Though I do have I do have to say I. I often play with my friend Kip, who's kind of a power gamer. And because he's not like super connected to the Arkham community and the metagame that goes with it, mm -hmm. he has no idea. So I, get, I, I like to hand him the really busted decks. Yeah. So I just built him just like that classic power combo of just un uh, no taboo Milan, yeah. no taboo higher ed in Rex. Yep. And it's fun. It's fun yeah. to just, be powerful just sometimes. Watch it go ham. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm. Higher ed, I could still see being a couple XP chain. Mm -hmm. um, I think streetwise is fine. Streetwise is fine. Scrapper is absolutely okay. Yeah, Scrapper should be like 2 XP. Uh, you know what? The only reason I think Scrapper belongs at 3, specifically in Survivor, is because Survivor has all those ways to, like, all those cards that say if you have zero resources, and Scrapper's oh, a real sure. good pressure valve. If, a real good way to just spend down like randomly in, in moments. Yeah, and you can do it like even if you're not uh, testing like combat, if you're testing intellect, you can still boost your combat with Scrapper in that turn or in that really. Test. So it just doesn't do anything. It just doesn't do anything, huh. but you can do it to drop it okay. drop down to zero resources. So all right, well that's better than I thought it was. So sure, all yeah. right, three XP. You got me. You got yeah. me. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's it for uh, FAQ. That's it. That's it. It it was like I mean, and that last two minutes was us talking about the old old FAQ. It was a really small FAQ, and honestly, I like it. Um, it was just a just a light touch, I think, and mm -hmm. yeah, just a slight course correction ahead of Hemlock, I assume. Mm -hmm. Any chance that Power Word got taken off and we missed it, like we did with the? Uh, let me check. No, that's still there. All right, well, maybe next time. I don't think so. <laughs> you know what's still there, though, is double or nothing. I wonder when that one might become something like limit one per deck and then, like, remove from game after sure. or something. I'm trying to think double or nothing. I, it has been so long since that card was in my brain. Mm -hmm. Is that a level zero card or is that it a leveled is. up card? Level. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's level zero. Okay. Yeah. It, it all, again, I also have not thought of it forever, except when thinking about, like, haha, it's the only forbidden card. Mm -hmm. The first and only. Yeah. Maybe, or maybe, like, you can only commit double or nothing. You can't commit any other skill cards, because that was the whole thing, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's... I like that adjustment that you just said. Like, it's still abusable, because there's other ways to get stats, but, mm -hmm. like, you may commit... the double. You, you can only commit double or nothing... Yeah. And nothing else. And Big Kahuna says double or nothing could be commit only to a basic action test, maybe. There, there's got to be something, right? Like, mm -hmm. bring that card back. Come on. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, well, if we're knocking down scavenging, I don't know if we're in a place to bring back double yeah. or nothing, but I don't I know. Mean, we'll see I how. Feel like double well, or nothing that's... comes back, and like two weeks later, there's like a, a super fast FAQ update. Like, oh, no, it's back on there. <laughs> <laughs> we made a mistake. It's nothing. It, it went nothing. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Well, uh, yeah, nice light touch. 
So that brings us on to talking about the investigator expansion for Hemlock Vale. So before we get into that, actually, I think we wanted to address kind of like format going forward, because I know we're we're kind of doing a new thing. And this is the first real release that has dropped since we've changed our format. So given that we've gone to monthly, we, we talked about it and we kind of decided that it would take like three to five episodes if we were rushing to mm -hmm. talk about every single player card as we have kind of done for, for the last little while. Mm hmm. And that's that's half our year right there. And, you know, I there is some appeal since we're only getting like one uh, release per year now. But at the same time, we do still want to like be able to talk about other things. Mm -hmm. So going forward, we, we have decided that we are going to talk more uh, from the expan when the expansions come out. We're going to talk more about the investigators and kind of the general card pool that follows them rather than going through and reviewing every single card as we used to do. Um, though, you know, it's not out of the question if people really want us to talk at length about player cards, we could revive the AV club. That could happen. We have been talking about streaming stuff. So if that's something that people want, um, that is, that is content we can do. It's just, we mm -hmm. don't want that to take up all of our audio podcast time for months. Yeah. yeah. So that being said... Let's hop on in. Um, mm -hmm. Let's start with Wilson and his Guardian cards. So, Scott, would you like to read Wilson? Yeah, it's Wilson Richards, the handyman. Uh, he's got the stat line that I think I hate the most. 3-3-3-3. Three, 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 three. <laughs> <laughs> um, Agree. Yeah, Except for 1-1-1-1. One, 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 one. I'm not a big fan of that one either. Uh, I don't know. I like that one, actually. The investigators that come with it are great. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, uh, he's a drifter. Reduce the resource cost of the first tool asset you play each round by one. You get plus one skill value during skill tests you use on tool assets. Elder sign effect plus zero. You may swap a tool asset in your play area with a tool asset in your hand with equal or lower printed costs. Eight health, six sanity. And flipping them over, deck size of 30, and his deck building options, tool cards, level 0 to 5. Guardian cards, level 0 to 4. Neutral cards, level 0 to 5. And up to 5 other improvised or upgrade cards, level 0 to 1. And then he has his signature, signature weakness, and a random basic weakness. Alright. So, I will say, as much as I hate 3333, mm -hmm. I think that that is, just looking at the 3s, I think you have to read the second sentence on his card. Yes. And he's agreed. more of a four 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 four. Yes. He's he's a three 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 during the mythos phase. Yeah. And that's about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I like, Sean? I like fours across the board. <laughs> that that is a, a more enticing prospect, yes. Mm hmm Well and especially so here's the other thing, is I do think the threes are more excusable with, with Wilson here because of his card access. Mm -hmm. Since he's trait based and not like class based mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot more versatility out of what he's going to be packing in his deck then he gets the skill value on top of that like i haven't played him yet so this this is just shooting from the hip on this one but i i do think that's a redeemable stat line in, in wilson he's kind of a cool ideally flexy little little guardian right mm -hmm. i will uh i'll throw it out there and this is maybe one of those bold statements that I'll regret later. Uh, no, I don't think I will. Um, <laughs> I find that the investigators that have trait-based building 0 to 5 interest me way more than every other investigator style building. And I only think, I think that those style of deck building options, where it's all trait-based, only function at this life of the game, at this stage of the game, in his mm -hmm. life or whatever, where the card pool is so immense. Like when you search tool cards, you're given a list of like 60. Yeah, it's big. I just did that myself. It's uh, yeah, it's expansive. Plus, you also get five other improvised or upgrade cards. Like this is just like it does pigeonhole him a bit, but that pigeonhole is also very large. I mean, he still gets to take guardian cards up to yeah. four. Yeah. Like and we'll we'll talk about this as we go through, but I do feel like the deck building uh, options for the investigators in this box are a little generous. 
Yes. And agreed. I'm a fan. Mm-hmm. Like compared compared to just like what has been done in the past, mm-hmm. um, the, the, like the the box seems wider for a lot of these investigators. Um, can you imagine trying to build a deck for him without Arkham DB? Nope. Or some kind I of cannot. computer assisted program. I don't know the fuck's a tool, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> it's never mattered before. Oh uh, yeah. Um, also, art by Magali. Just throwing out there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Classic. I'll read. So, at... yeah. Finish him off. Yeah, it's uh, it's a signature event. It's a two cost event with two wilds. Love to see it. Improvise and upgrade traded. Wilson Richards deck only. Attach ad hoc to a tool or weapon asset you control. Reaction after resolving an action ability on attached asset, exhaust ad hoc and discard a tool or weapon asset from your hand. Resolve an action ability on the discarded asset, ignoring all costs. Sledgehammer! Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So I guess my question is can you do a sledgehammer, the big attack from this? I actually don't know. <sighs> I. That was my instinct, but I guess I don't know that for sure. Is it a might... three action ability technically also a single action ability as far as card syntax goes? I wonder if it's one of those things where you have to pay the extra actions. Like you would pay Possibly. two actions in addition well, it to It says the ignoring all costs. Sorry, Duke says nope. Nope into what? It doesn't. Listen to live rule. You ignore you all ignore of it. All of it. Oh, oh, this is really cool. Dude, oh. Can you come to our shows more often? Right, the ignoring <laughs> all costs. You know what, Sean? Reading the card explains the card. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty fire, if, if I do say so myself. This is one um, heck of a card. That's true. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's it's very uh, like uh, Last of Us crafting system vibes, and I'm sure there are mm-hmm. many other video games that feel similar. But the idea that you like just slap a nail onto your hammer—I don't know what yeah. was the first one I thought—and then the but nail, I guess it... and then the nail falls out of the hammer, but you still have the hammer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is cool. I love this. Mm-hmm. And uh... <laughs> oh my god, Big Coon! I love Scrubs. Knife yeah. wrench. <laughs> <laughs> um, Guardian also has a ton of things with, with upgrades and ways to bring it back into your hand and stuff. So Wilson got the right class here. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Well, let's finish it off with the weakness. Yeah. Hasty repairs. It's a weakness. It's a treachery, a blunder traded revelation, put hasty repairs into play in your threat area. When triggering abilities on assets you control, set your base skill value to zero. Double action, discard hasty repairs. Oof. So, I know sometimes people don't like the double actions because they're kind of boring, but I feel like the theme and what this yes. does while it's in play makes up for it. And I don't, I don't mind the double actions. I never really had a problem with them. Um, but I don't have a problem with them. They're just kind of boring. But I feel like this one is not boring just because of what it does. No, one hundred percent. Like I I, I'm it. with you. They like it fits the theme perfectly on yeah. this one. I love it and I hate it. <laughs> It's going to it's going to come out at some really bad times. I know sure that much. Is. Yep. This is going to crush some dreams in the process. Mm. There there will be many attacks and very little opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> as a result of this card. Is Wilson's real uh <laughs> real signature card tool belt? <laughs> I would imagine so. Like I feel like that is just you you actually build a 28 card deck and just put in tool belt. Mm-hmm. Twice, mm-hmm. yeah, agree. Everyone likes more hand slots when like most of your deck takes hand slots. Yeah, I I'm really like I I've <laughs> tooled around with uh, mm-hmm. a couple of Wilson decks, and I'm really excited to actually put uh, rubber to the road and get them into a campaign. Yeah, Very... so like rounding back to his deck building. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we've got we've got tools, we've got guardian cards, and then the the little the little five card splashes in this uh, this expansion are really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. So five other improvised and or upgrade cards. Do you do you have in mind like what choice cards you'd be looking at? Like the upgrade oh, cards boy. make sense because you're looking at all of the stuff that we have like well maintained and other upgrade cards. Um, yeah. And, 
no is my answer. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of improvised. Like, let me let me search. Is an act of desperation here. improvised? I th I know it's tactic. Yeah. It might also be improvised. I know the uh, the all of the stuff that plays from your discard pile, like yeah. winging it and improvised weapon and. The tough thing with that though is that the. Um... You're not getting his, his plus one bonus on those improvised ones. Like, I, I think True. I'm probably going to use the upgrades. Because, like, Wilson, to me, is very much, again, with the puns, a, a toolboxy deck. I do agree mm -hmm. with Xylo in chat, though. Um, I'm worried about Wilson's consistent damage output with uh, with his, his tools and his weapons. Mm -hmm. But Yeah, so improvised turns up. Uh, throw the book at them, which I don't think he's looking at. Impromptu barrier, improvised shield, improvised weapon, makeshift trap. Okay, I can see. I can see make, makeshift trap. It's not a tool, so he's. I mean, you don't do any skill tests on it, though. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see that one. Do you uh, think push to the limit, which is in this box and is very good for Wilson. Mm -hmm. Snare trap and winging it. Do you think that improvised was kind of thrown in there? Um, more thematically than mechanically possibly i also think po like i don't know i can only speculate but push to the limit seems like a very wilson card that i would be like heartbroken not to be, be able to put in that deck hmm. and i think they knew that yeah yeah but yeah it could also be just flavor like wilson's like on the job just figuring shit out and repairing it with what he has you know just making do He's a little survivory. I can see adding more survivor access because basically that trait adds eighty percent survivor access. Yeah. Ad hoc is the other improvised card, and then throw the book at them. <laughs> just yeah. seeker. I'm just gonna so. quickly read push to the limit just because. We're yes, we so have much. talked about it. Uh, mm -hmm. So survivor event tactic improvised traded. It's two cost willpower and uh, combat icon, or. Um, anyways, choose a weapon or tool asset in your discard pile. Resolve an action ability on that asset, ignoring all costs, including its action cost. After this effect resolves, shuffle the chosen asset into your deck. Playing this card does not provide a tax of opportunity. So, you could use Push the Limit with Ad Hoc to chuck the Sledgehammer with Ad Hoc doing the triple action. And then use Push to the Limit to, to do use, it again. To do the triple again. And then shuffle it back into your deck. So you can then See, hopefully draw it again and ad hoc it and then push it to the limit. <laughs> See, I would be heartbroken if you had not been able to take this card. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Interesting. Guardian cards. Any other ones that are jumping out at you? Um, yeah, so I think the uh the katana it gets a shout out for me just for like pure coolness. Uh I do like the it's interesting at level zero, and I almost wonder if maybe this started at a different level or or a different power level and got tuned back. Mm -hmm. But I really I really like what it ended up doing at level zero. Um, so Katana is a uh, four cost guardian asset. It has a combat icon, takes up two hand slots, item, weapon, and melee trait. Action fight. You get plus two combat for this test if you exceed by exactly two. You may exhaust the katana to deal plus two damage for this attack. And squiggly boy, exhaust katana, fight. Use agility instead of combat for this attack. Hmm. So, I'm not saying I'm, like, impressed with how great it is. I like the theme. Yeah. I like the idea of, like, the, with a katana, you are, you are making precise cuts. You're not making broadsword swipes and smashes. Uh, that makes all kinds of sense. Um, but if you succeed by exactly two, you get to like go in for the big hit, like three damage in a single shot for a level zero weapon is really good. Mm -hmm. However, if you can't pull that together, then you can get like the quick swipe out and, and get an extra damage out of it that way. So is it the most efficient weapon ever? No. Does machete kind of ruin all level zero car <laughs> level zero cards in people's brains? Also Maybe no, yes, depends on who you talk to. Um, I think I think it's a cool card. I just think it's yeah. it, it's a damn shame that not only can Kohaku not take this card, if he did, he'd be terrible at using it. 
Yeah, it, the succeeding by exactly two thing is that's that's what does it for me. Like I get the theme, I get it, theme win, but I'm like eh, mm -hmm. for actually playing it. Yeah, it's gonna be one of those things where like I don't know, Lily. This might be this might be like you know Dragon Pole and Katana in Lily. That feels okay. Mm -hmm. Or Axe. It could just be Axe. Ah, oh, son, son of a bitch. Axe. Axe is just so good. What are the ones you like? Ancestral Token, uh, mm. which is a guardian asset. It's an accessory. Item, charm, and blessed traded. Three cost, one willpower icon. Uh, and it has null health, two sanity. Reaction, after you defeat an enemy, exhaust Ancestral Token. Add blessed tokens to the chaos bag equal to that enemy's printed health. Maximum of five. Um, this one absolutely got slammed into my blessed Zoe deck because... Yeah. And then also Relic Hunter, so I could take this and the cross. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty decent. I ran mm -hmm. this in uh, Kohaku, and <laughs> against my better judgment, I kind of took on... Because Justin played Alessandra in our, in our playthrough of Hemlock, and I took on kind of the bigger bulk of enemy management. So this seemed like a good idea. I don't think Kohaku is its best place. But no. the card itself, if you're playing Bless and you're Killer, like, holy shit. Why yes. not? So good. Honestly, if you're playing Killer and you don't have a decent accessory. Mm -hmm. Why not look like, at this anyway and just, like, sprinkle the bag with goodness? Yeah. And this is my whole thing about Bless and Curse from way back when is Bless, just the tokens alone are good. Curse, True. you need that big payoff because the tokens are bad. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Second Wind, the upgrade one, got a big glow up. Mm -hmm. um, it's zero cost. Now it heals two damage, three instead, if you drew a treachery. And it draws a card. Pretty solid. Love it. We're going to we're gonna talk about all the masks, because like one of the strongest oh, themes throughout that we got to talk about all the masks. So let's talk about the Wolf Mask. Uh, wolf Mask, the Moon's Sire is one cost it has a combat and agility icon item charm and mask traded so amina can take it uh limit one mask per investigator uses two offerings replenish one of these offerings after you engage an enemy mm. and then squiggly boy spend an offering you can get either plus two combat or plus two agility for this skill test limit are, once per test are all the masks just bonkers good because i feel like I most think... of them are I think all the masks are good. I think there are some that are... I don't know. There, It's an interesting discussion. Uh, I, I think this mask is, like, universally possibly the best. Because mm. if you're taking this in a Guardian, yeah. you will likely be engaging enemies. If you're mm. engaging enemies, you will likely be using agility and or combat. Mm -hmm. And, you like, this, rinse and repeat. This is just a very good skill boost for exactly what you're likely to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I'm, I'm having a really good time with this one. Yeah, I think, for me, it's a battle between this one and the mouse mask. Only because the mouse mask, which is the, the, the seeker one, and it, it replenishes when you um, reveal a new location. Mm -hmm. Reveal or move to? I forget what. Uh, reveal might location. Reveal or put into play. Put into play. That's what it is. Um, and it does willpower and intellect and for me like solo like this is just getting slammed into ursula dubs mm -hmm. right like absolutely it's insanely good um but i do see it i can see how if in in big like a four-player game it's not as good wolf mm -hmm. mask is always going to be good even better in a four-player game yeah like you are just gonna be you're gonna spend these offerings and replenish them like this is yeah a windmill slam onto the board mm -hmm. yeah. and you know I think Mouse Mask is like tied for number one, right? Like, yeah. Um, they just, they're, they're so easy to replenish and they're doing exactly what you want them to do in the investigator that you're going to take them in. Mm -hmm. The other ones are all good, but the, the conversation is slightly more nuanced than that. Yeah. Um, um, I do have to call out the uh, bonded keyword came back in a big way Ooh, in, this, yeah. in this campaign. So I want to call out the Eyes of Illusia because this one was really cool. I've yet to be able to play it, and I'm very excited for when I get around to it. 
uh, but it's super cool. So the eyes of Volusia, the mother's cunning. I do like the in-universe reference to things we've seen in past campaigns. Mm. Um, is a guardian asset. It's three cost, level four. It is, uh, let's see here, item, relic, and spell traded. It has a willpower and combat icon. Action, parlay. So Alessandra can take it. Choose an enemy at your location until the end of the round. Each investigator gets plus one skill value while fighting, evading, or parlaying with the chosen enemy. Place a resource on Eyes of Illusia as a charge. And then squiggly boy action. Search your bonded cards for Blade of Yoth and swap it with Eyes of Illusia, moving all charges from Eyes of Illusia to Blade of Yoth. So... You get to charge this up while making it easier for you and your compadres to deal with enemies. Hmm. So the, the Blade of Yoth is the father's ire. Um, uh, so so uh, we still have uh, Hand Slot, Arcane Slot. This is now a uh, item, relic, weapon, and melee trait. Action, spend one to three charges, fight, fight. For this attack, you may use willpower instead of combat. You get plus two skill value and deal plus one damage for each charge spent as a part of this action's cost. And then again, free action, you can search your bonded cards for Eyes of Illusion and swap it with Blade of Yoth. So, I don't know. I have no idea how good this card is. It seems really fun, and I love the theme. The fact that you, like, mm -hmm. charge this up and then your blade is empowered... And then your energy is spent, so you like go back to the eyes. Yeah, I do. At like... level four, guardian. I'm trying to think who takes this though. Vinny did mention big Carson energy because, like, mm. you know, you're in a room with an enemy, and you could parlay three times, and now True. everyone gets plus three on hitting a big boss or something. True. Like that's in a boss fight. That's insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and obviously. As mentioned, a lot of this box feels like it's it's a toy for Alessandra. Because mm -hmm. she can take the the eyes, which means she gets access to the blade. Um, and, you know, she has that free action for parlaying every turn, and that seems like a pretty decent way to use it sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to do one last quick one. Uh, let's see. Do I want to do Purified or Guided by Faith? Both great cards. Um, you know, I'll do Purified. Guardian skill, innate blessed traded max one committed per test has no icons you may commit purified to any type of test if the test is successful for each point you succeed by to a maximum of five add one blessed token or remove a curse token from the chaos bag mm. love this especially mm -hmm. in blurse wendy and at level zero it's asking very little of you yeah so you can either get those curses out that you won't don't want or just pump that bag full of blesses yeah I do like, a, like, we have so, well, I mean, we'll get to it in the wrap-up probably, but I love that we have so many little tools mm -hmm. now for Blurse. Like, yes. you know, Innsmouth did drop a good pool for Blurse, but it's so nice to have new things now, and this this, this yeah. will find its way into some decks. I mean, it's it's a mechanic that pretty much got doubled with this, mm -hmm. and it's just, yeah, combined, it's, it's like you had two expansions full of one mechanic and it's mm -hmm. amazing yeah it's a cool world and i've been playing pretty much exclusively with blurs cards since hemlock dropped i can say like oh i i am reminded of how much an emotional roller coaster that mechanic <laughs> can be bless bless curse bless curse curse bless auto El fail elder sign <laughs> yeah, one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> happens more yeah. than i care to admit oh hey also the uh little Bless Curse Rolly Tracker thing that we got in the box. That was pretty yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. That was handy. Especially for Kohaku purposes. Yes. <laughs> it's very, very nice to be able to just look quickly yeah. and not... And this is how I've been doing it up to this point is I just keep my Bless and Curse tokens like Stacked. in a two by five row yeah. next to the play area and just looking over, but so much simpler now. That is basically Kohaku's signature asset. Is that Rolly, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Bless Curse counter? <laughs> yes. Right. All right. Well, let's move it on to Kate. Yeah. Who is Kate Winthrop, the scientist? She is a seeker and she has two willpower, four intellect, two combat, and four agility, Miskatonic and scholar traded. 
You begin the game with Flux Stabilizer inactive side face up. Squiggly Boy, move one clue from Kate Winthrop to a science or tool asset you control with no clues on it. And forced, when an asset you control with a clue on it leaves play, place its clue on your location. Uh, and then Elder Sign is plus zero. You may move one clue from an asset you control back to Kate. Mm -hmm. And then she has a, a very standard Seeker, six health and eight agility. Her yeah. deck size is 30. She gets Seeker cards zero to five, Science cards zero to four, Insight cards zero to one, and Neutral cards zero to five. I will be very interested as a quick aside if mm -hmm. we ever hit an investigator that is limited on what level neutral cards they can take and why we would ever do that. Mm. Just a thought. So most notably, science level zero to four, uh, she can't take the lightning gun, unfortunately. Too true. Mm. Oh, wait, which isn't science anyways, but people kept on saying it should have science trait. Never mind, I'm an idiot. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm with you in spirit. Yeah. I suppose we didn't even talk about, uh, when we were talking about Wilson... <laughs> How much how much everyone is crying over the fact that, you know, back when Fire Axe came out, we weren't mm. really thinking about Wilson's six, you know, campaigns later on yeah. and Fire Axe does not have the tool trait when, you know, I think everyone nowadays would agree that it that it would. Yeah. Um My thing and I'm fine with that. That just happens. That is mm -hmm. that is just the world we live in for a game that lives this long and gets expanded this much. Yep. I just kind of wish that they didn't feel the need to carry that through and they could have given, like, Fire Axe level 2 the tool trait. Mm -hmm. I, I would empower them that way as a player, yeah. but I don't know I don't know if people are more stickler than me. Star Wars LCG actually had a little problem like this where they started adding leader to card traits. And there's mm. some old cards that don't have leader trait, but the, the whole leader trait became important. And there was old cards that didn't True, have True, especially on, like, the, the like Rebel and Imperial factions. Yeah. Anyways, back to Kate. Yeah, so uh, moving on to the Flux Stabilizer. On the inactive side, so it's permanent, Kate Winthrop deck only. Forced, after a clue is placed on Flux Stabilizer, search your bonded cards or discard pile for one copy of Etheric Current and shuffle it into your deck. Then flick... Uh, no, not then. Then's not there, and that's really important. That was me adding that in. I'm sorry. It just says flip Flux Stabilizer, keeping all tokens and attachments. So, uh, the other side of Flux Stabilizer, and I don't know if anyone else has this problem. It took me so long to wrap my head around Kate. It took yes. me so long to wrap my head around Kate, and we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to do it together, I promise. I've played her a bit. We can do this. So, the other side of Kate, which is actually not showing up on Arkham DB, I can tell you, just says reaction. After you place a clue on an asset you control, you get plus two to the next skill test that you take this phase. Mm -hmm. or turn it might be turn this phase it is phase okay cool yep. uh so then we have the two copies of etheric current so you can choose either or both depending on when things flip and whatnot but you you get to go pick so etheric current yugoth is a level zero event it has a combat icon science traded play only a flux stabilizer is on its active side fight Move all clues on assets you control to Kate. For this attack, you may use intellect instead of combat. And if you succeed and the attacked enemy is non-elite, you may exhaust it and move it to any location. Draw one card. Flip Flux Stabilizer, keeping all tokens and attachments. So let's pause for a quick second here, because this is the first <laughs> one where, like, yes. there's really things going on. So you, you flip... So you place a clue on... You, okay, so the first step is you get a clue with Kate. Yeah. That's step one. Step two is you put said clue onto Flux Stabilizer to power it up. Mm -hmm. When you power it up, you choose one of your etheric currents, like Yugoth, and you shuffle it into your deck. Then, once it's flipped, you get to get the, the skill boost from subsequent clues you put on things. Mm -hmm. And then you get to play these etheric currents when they come up. But you also want to have a lot of science and tool assets out so you can trigger yes. the active one. Because you can only put one clue on each. Correct. You can only put a clue on one that doesn't have it already, which is, mm -hmm. like, super important. Um, 
and then it flips it again and and, and sorry each etheric current flips the st flux capacitor and you start the whole process over again mm -hmm. so the other etheric current is yogoth um basically everything's this or sorry yoth it's yoth not we just did yogoth so we have an agility icon on this one um it is an evade instead move all clues on assets you control to kate for this evasion attempt you may use intellect instead of agility if you succeed and the target of this evasion is non-elite, shuffle it into the encounter deck. Draw a card. Flip Flux Stabilizer. So the Etheric Current cards are both really powerful. You get an, an attack and a big move against mm -hmm. a non-elite. And then uh, you get you get a pretty decent evade and a just a close call, basically. Mm -hmm. Remember close call, guys? Vaguely. You don't play that one anymore. What I well, like I'll about just play persuasion now. What I like about these two is so you move your move the the active side of the flux stabilizers are, is up, so you can place a clue on an asset you control and get the plus two skill value. You move when you play one of these two etheric currents, you move all clues on assets you control back to Kate, mm -hmm. and then during this test, during some window, you can use her little zappy boy ability to give yourself plus two a couple of times on assets again because you've just moved all the clues back and now all your assets are empty of clues. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because you flip Flux Stabilizer at the end. See, here I was so... Yeah, that's that's really cool. I like that. At least I think that's how that works. I Talking it through, that timing seems right to me. Because it, it, it says evade and then move all the clues, blah, blah, blah. For this evasion attempt, you may use... Uh, intellect instead of agility. Then it says if you succeed. So the test is somewhere in there to me. So Agree. Agree. Yeah. So, oh, Kate. Yeah. What thoughts have you? Oh, boy. Uh, as, so, a, as an Ursula stand, she's very so, close in a lot of ways. Uh, very yeah. close in a lot of ways being her stat line, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think... She is similar in that she's yellow and has four intellect and four agility. I think Kate is way more of a build a tableau of things and yes. then take advantage of all the signs and tools you have. Um, the way I've kind of tinkered with her is trying to use all the ones. It's like, if you succeed by one, succeed by three, succeed by whatever, if you fail by this. like And so um, all these pass fails at various numbers and they're all science and stuff like that um so i'm using her to use her flux capacitor and, and whatnot but i'm also making it so every time i pass or fail a test basically there's something else that happens advantageously and mm -hmm. so it takes a couple turns to build that tableau up um but eventually and put clues on it yeah and but eventually you just start like every time you take a test you're, let's say, getting a clue, but you're also drawing a card or and getting a resource and doing something else. Like it just, you know. It's usually a kicker. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I'm only three and a half scenarios into my campaign with, with Kate, um, which is the point where I stopped and started doing Dissonant Voices. So it's going to be a real long time before I change my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. But she seems really good. Uh, I do like her in two player because, you know, as we've mentioned, two player is a little bit closer to solo than it is to four player. Mm -hmm. Well, that's even reductive, but it's closer to solo than four player than people think. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the idea that your seeker and who who is going to be just primarily getting clues can also very easily dip into, OK, well, I'm going to help out and just like evade this enemy. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Her kit is really cool. I mean, there's yeah. the succeed by whatever build that you talked about. Um, I think chemistry set is probably worth uh, talking about in her because that triggers on evade. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the the science cards in this expansion really flesh out what she can do. I also just really love an investigator, especially like a, a clue based investigator that can also defend themselves early. Like yeah, having four evade, right? Like you don't need to be babysat, and if you are, if she's the investigator and you're the killer, you don't need to worry about her for the first couple turns. Like she can evade if she needs. She's fine. Yeah. So the, I mean, the other thing is that 
you shouldn't undercut the fact that once you get a clue onto the flux, uh, I was about to say flux capacitor, <laughs> onto the flux stabilizer, mm -hmm. uh, this is an investigator who's a little bit like Mark in that mm -hmm. suddenly you have a pretty easily accessible plus two to anything available to you. Mm -hmm. And I find, even though she's got you know two willpower, that makes her quite resilient in the mythos phase. Because suddenly, if you can, if you hit something bad like a willpower test and you need to pump to four, mm -hmm. it's usually within her reach to do that. And in fact, I would say a lot of times you should maybe like save a clue and a spot for it for yeah. that moment. And then pushing from four to a place where you're going to succeed is a hell of a lot easier. And it costs her almost nothing. So she's... She's very versatile in a, in a way that I don't think is readily apparent until you start getting her on the board and like putting clues on important uh, uh, on assets during important tests. Yeah, you know where we sh she actually may uh, come into contact with a willpower test is her signature weakness, which we totally true totally blew by. Yeah, um, it's a failed experiment. It is a treachery weakness, uh, blunder treated revelation test three willpower. Note that she has two. Uh, <laughs> this, this test gets plus one difficulty for each asset you control with a clue on it. For each point you fail by, you must either take one horror or place one of your clues on your location. This one is la bonkers. It's a backbreaker sometimes. <laughs> because if you, the thing is, is... if you have it flipped over, you can put mm -hmm. a clue on something, but it only gives you plus one instead of plus yep. two. An effective plus one because you're also raising the difficulty. Yep. Yeah, you're going to be dropping a lot of clues. My solution is, I mean, you will drop some clues very likely. Mm -hmm. Also, just run a lot of sanity soak in, yeah, uh, in Kate or or sanity healing. You know, we all love some logical reasoning, some um, willpower just, icons, which aren't very hard to come by in Seeker. True. Yep. This is just one of those weaknesses where, like, you gotta think about it. Yeah. I know some investigators have one where you can kind of just play your game and you deal with the weakness when it pops up, but this is one you have to be like keep yeah. in mind until you're past it. Mm -hmm. All right, Scott, any... Uh, uh, well, here, I'll go first. Uh, so selects from the Seeker card pool. I think chemistry set is really interesting, and it, it plays very keenly into that play style that you were talking about. Um, so level zero, two cost, Seeker asset. Uh, it is agility icon. It has item, tool, and science traits. Exhaust chemistry chemistry set. Investigate. If you fail by exactly two, discard chemistry set. Succeed by exactly zero, gain two resources. Succeed by exactly two, draw one card. Succeed by exactly four, discover one additional clue at your location. And it takes up an accessory slot. It's weird to have a chemistry set around your neck. <laughs> yeah. This is also kind of cool in, I was thinking Daisy, just because she can take premonition. And some sure. of the other mystic, like, um, yeah, like, was it read the signs? No, not read the signs. What's the one with the broken fingers? Where you draw uh, five tokens? Dark prophecy? Yes. One where you yeah, draw, draw five tokens? Yeah, draw five tokens, pull a symbol. Yeah. Yep, that's Dark Prophecy. Uh, yeah, so she has some manipulation there, which would be probably easier to, to trigger this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, the, the best way to be able to manipulate this is going to be things you can do after you see a token, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, like, like you were mentioning, the Mystic Access is helpful. I imagine there's got to be some Survivor cards that are pretty okay at helping something like this out. Mm-hmm. But when you pair it with a card, I'm sure you're going to mention one Dr. Charles West the oh, Third. Yes. Well, go on then. So okay, well, Dr. Charles West the Third knows his purpose. Uh, seeker ally, three costs, intellect and combat icons, uh, ally and science traded, one health, two sanity. You have one additional hand slot, which can only be used to hold a tool asset, and reaction after you successfully investigate by exactly one or three exhaust. Dr. Charles West III, deal one damage to an enemy at your location. So if there's an enemy so, at your location and you investigate with chemistry set and you have Charles out, basically if you're you... are doing something. <laughs> if you succeed between zero and four, something's happening. 
it's a cool little set. And then we got we got Lab Coat in TSK, which feels like a, a little amuse bouche mm-hmm. uh, for what was coming. I am curious, like how deep in they were, or, or if, like what if they knew what they were going to be doing in the next uh, the next expansion, mm-hmm. where that is one secret card where you can modify the results of a test after the fact. Yeah. I so. believe it only gets it to zero, but it it stops it from failing if I'm yeah. remembering correctly. Another card I like, uh, we talked about Most Mask, which is just mm-hmm. fantastic. It's mm-hmm. uh, like all the other masks. Uh, you replenish one of the charges when you uh, reveal a new location or put a lo- new location into play, and you can spend it for two willpower, two intellect. Um, but uh, Testing Sprint, mm-hmm. I really like. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Testing Sprint is a seeker event with willpower uh intellect or agility icons sorry one cost insight and double traded as an additional cost to play testing sprint spend an action so basically two actions investigate one at a time investigate your location and each connecting location once each in ascending order of shroud until you either fail to investigate or successfully investigate each eligible location so if you are standing in the middle of certain maps Mm -hmm. (laughs) this might be two actions five investigates and five clues Mm-hmm. And those are each individual test. So if you have deductions or whatnot, you can put those in there too. Really good card. I think it really shines in probably high count multiplayer. Kind of, kind of in a similar way to. Uh, oh no, what's the? Oh, in the no. The, no, it's the big event that uh, investigates every revealed location. It's oh. like level five. Yeah, I know. Oh no, I'm about. losing my touch, guys. It's that one. Losing my touch. Everyone knows that that one, one. yeah. Anyway, in that vein, if you've got a bunch of minions who can go around opening up the map for you and and you stand in a good spot, like what is the, I guess my question is, what is the minimum amount of locations that makes this okay? Is it three? Um, Three's okay. I'd prefer four, which requires only three connecting locations, which isn't crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it's your location plus everything connected. True. So, like, if you're at a T, probably some if you're at a T intersection, like that's four locations, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I dig it. I dig yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I do want to call out real quick the the um, the microscope because mm. I find it really interesting the design space that exists to increase clue acceleration. Because mm-hmm. I feel like they have to be really fucking careful. Yes. And that can't be an easy thing to do. Mm-hmm. And it also then leaves you in the bind of like, well, how do we ever make something as exciting as fingerprint kit? You mm-hmm. know, like something is just basically good as that one. But anyway, microscope, two cost, uh, intellect icon, item, tool, science, traits. Reaction after an enemy at your location is successfully evaded or defeated. Place a resource on microscope as evidence. And you also exhaust microscope to do that. Mm-hmm. And then double action investigate. You get plus one uh, intellect for this investigation for each evidence on microscope to a max of plus three. And if you succeed, you may spend up to two evidence to get that many additional clues. And that's a hand slot. So I think this one stands toe to toe with fingerprint kit in multiplayer and multiplayer only so maybe solo in in kate or ursula and that's like it or um trish oh yeah 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 i kind of always forget about trish now oh we have the trifecta now don't we we do um my only my only thing with this is the fact it doesn't start with any evidence and you can only gain one per turn essentially Uh uh-huh um that kind of slows it down for me like on the turn you play it it does nothing and and that's kind of where i'm i'm iffy on it um Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i'll have to try it out to see if it's uh like i think it might be right in three player because Mm -hmm. this is a way to get exactly three clues with the true evidence um, which I find three player is usually the weird place where like fingerprint kit, you want to get the upgraded one. Um, I mean, this one, the upgraded microscope, the level four, uh, basically the same card, except you get plus two 
intellect for each evidence up to max plus six, and you can spend up to three evidence. So then you can make it uh, four clues. But seems it, decent. Yeah. Okay, last one, super quick. Uh, throw mm -hmm. the book at them. <laughs> the yep. Seeker event, uh, one cost, intellect and combat icons, uh, Gambit and Improvised. Uh, oh, so... Um, <laughs> what's so Mark can take it. Wilson can take it. <laughs> oh, no, Wilson can take Wilson, it. Wilson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fight, choose a tome asset you control. You get plus X combat for this attack, where X is that asset's printed cost. If you succeed, you may either automatically evade the attacked enemy, or after the attack ends, you may resolve an action or... Uh, Zappy Boy ability on the chosen asset, ignoring its action cost, if any. Um, I love it. Mm -hmm. In Daisy. <laughs> this is Yeah, I was about sweet. to say, it, it, it's perfect art. It's Daisy just smashing a spider with the tome. Yep. It's really cool. It's I, I do like the the kind of reflections of active desperation that we're getting in Yes. In non red factions. Yeah. Okay, also, ultra quick, Transmogrify might be, like, my flavor and art win in this box. I, mm. I really love Transmogrify. But we're not going to talk about it as a card. Um, oh, it is very moving nice. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. You know what? And let's... We talked about Alessandra as an investigator e extensively mm -hmm. when we got to preview her. So we're going to be really quick on Alessandra, and then we'll get to the rogue cards a little bit more quickly. Mm -hmm. You want to read Alessandra? Yeah, you bet. So, uh, Alessandra, the Countess, uh, three willpower, four intellect, two combat, four agility, drifter, and socialite. You may take an additional action during your turn, which can only be used to parlay. I love extra actions. Elder sign effect, plus two. If you succeed, choose a non-elite enemy at your location or at a revealed location, revealed connecting location. Automatically evade that enemy. Uh, and she has seven health, seven sanity. Deck size is 30, deck building options, rogue cards 0 to 5, cards with parlay to level, or cards with parlay, level 0 to 5, neutral level 0 to 5. And then she's got three copies of Beguile, uh, her weakness Zamokona, and one random weakness. So I'll read Beguile, because you get three copies of this, which I love. Uh, it's a two cost event with a wild icon, trick traded, Alessandra only. Fast, play only during your turn. Attach Beguile to a non-elite enemy at your location. Action, parlay. Either move attached enemy to a revealed location, revealed connecting location, uh, or perform a basic investigate or evade action at its location. If you fail a skill test while resolving this ability, discard Beguile. You may activate this ability from any location. So three copies of that. And then we have... Her weakness, uh, Zamakona. He's a elite, or sorry, an enemy weakness. Three combat, three health, three evade. Elusive. Spawn. Nearest empty location if able. Alessandra cannot parlay with Zamakona. Forced. The first time Alessandra Zorzi parlays each round, place one doom on Zamakona. So Zamakona can be kind of a problem uh, for Alessandra. But if you've got a friend nearby, probably take care of him pretty quick. Yeah, ideally. We did talk about this, you know, when we previewed her. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a lot of, like, really good quick fixes for Zamakona herself. No. You've got backstab. Yep. Or, like, evade into sneak attack. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, not just evade, not just evade. You have to evade with, like... Uh, trigger, not trigger man. Shoot, what's the what's the uh, the guy shooting know. the hatchet man? No, hatchet man. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. However, it is possible to just like oh, it's so tough. It's yeah. so tough because like I was just about to say it's possible to not parlay. You can play the game that way, but like that's such a bummer, you know. But it's exactly like, where her. Her thing is parlay. Mm -hmm, exactly. Like, yeah, it's yeah. I love the fact that she has three copies of her signature card too. Like it just, yeah, love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. I do appreciate that they they kind of let her go really hard at parlaying. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, you could take power word. You could take, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do think persuasion has become an amazing card mm-hmm. in Alessandra specifically, but even beyond that, just the buff it got was was really good. Um, and yeah, she's 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 really good. Justin had a great time with her. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think what are what are some other like sneaky includes like the parlay cards are all pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it's like you build a deck of 28 cards and add fine clothes, so, right? <laughs> oh, shoot. What would what was... Oh, no. We, we figured out some, like, really cool interaction with fine clothes, and I'm trying to figure out what that was now, and i got to go look at all the cards. Well, for further words on Alessandra specifically, go check out our YouTube, cha- or our YouTube channel and the, the look what I found that we did on her. Mm-hmm. Um... While I'm looking for the thing I'm talking about, let's talk about the fox mask. Oh, yeah. What does the fox say? He is the wise trickster. Um, so this is the rogue one. It's one cost. It's got uh, intellect and agility icons. Limit one per two offerings. Replenish one of these offerings after you move out of a location with an enemy. That's the most highly specific one, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you spend an offering, you can get uh, plus two intellect or plus two agility for the skill test. So yeah. it is generally still the skills you want for a rogue. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I can see this in solo, maybe, and I feel like maybe Trish. But sure. this one is, is kind of restrictive with moving out of a location with enemy. I guess, you know what, in bigger player counts, too, it would be a lot easier to do that. True. Yes, and I, I think there are some cards here where I'm like, yeah, I think the, the primary amount of playtesting that was done was in high count multiplayer. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I guess I could say that about most. Well, just not <laughs> solo, maybe. Like, even yeah, in two-player, sure, you're sure. going to see double the amount of encounter cards. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, so the one I was thinking of was mm-hmm. Fake Credentials. Hmm. Um, so this is a pretty decent one. Really good in Trish, too. So we've got level zero, three cost, asset. It is uh, intellect icon, item, and illicit traits. Action, choose an enemy at your location and exhaust fake credentials to parlay. Test agility, or sorry, not agility, test intellect one. This test gets plus one difficulty for each suspicion on fake credentials. If you succeed, discover one clue at your location and place one resource at on fake credentials as suspicion. If you fail, you must either discard fake credentials or the chosen enemy attacks you. Takes up a hand slot. So I think this one's really cool. The flavor is just bang on. Like the, the, long, the longer you're flashing these things around, the more suspicion you're drawing, the longer people have to think about it, the worse it gets. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not really like acceleration, except in Alessandra, where she gets the extra test, I guess. She gets the extra action to do this test, so it is kind of in effect acceleration. Um, but you know, it's it's fine. I like the leveled up version more, but this one's cool. Yeah, I'm really excited to play her solo. Um, mm-hmm. It's just her her signature enemy br- make gives me pause. As well, it should. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, rogue cards I really like is. Uh, for solo, uh, light-footed. It's the uh, rogue skill uh, with the agility icon. If this test is successful during an evasion attempt, you may automatically evade another enemy at your location. How much of that would how much would that have saved Jack a headache in your <laughs> yes. uh, in your last game there? Several several headaches. I would have mm-hmm. I would have finished that scenario with like five more health. <laughs> yeah, I. Oh, sorry. Do you have more to say on, on mm-hmm. that one? No, just I okay, think it's so a, a really great uh, get out of jail free card mm-hmm. for uh, true, true. solo. Yeah. So as well, y'all know, I think one at least one slot in every Mystic deck I ever build has uh, a Storm of Spirits written on it. Mm-hmm. Except in solo, but even in solo, that card has pulled its weight sometimes. Um, so I love that card, and and as a result, I can't help but absolutely love Stir the Pot. Mm. Uh, so that's a three-cost Trick Gambit event. It is a parlay. 
uh, willpower and intellect icons. Choose an enemy at your location and test intellect X, where X is the chosen enemy's combined damage and horror values. If you succeed, deal two damage to each enemy at your location. And if you succeed by two or more, after resolving this effect, you may disengage from each enemy and move to a connecting location. Bonkers good. It's so good. And especially mm -hmm. for Alessandra, because beyond cards like this, she's not generally going to be like wiping too many enemies off the board. They're going to stick around. So like having a big bomb like this and a quick escape, if you hit it hard enough, oh, just mm -hmm. Justin used this card to great effect during our run. Uh, another card I want to bring up uh, that, you know, what, I'm not going to read. I want the listeners to go look at themselves because it's actually two cards, but the ally Bianca de Katz, Oh, really cool bonded, yeah. Is, oh my goodness, what an awesome, like, just the gist of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but she starts with a bunch of resources on her. You can exhaust her and parlay, move a bunch of resources onto her. Then you have to test agility based on how much you took. Um, and then if you fail, you have to remember you owe her X resources. And then she turns into an enemy. And then you can pay that enemy back and you can get Bianca back in your deck. So, so. Cool. Oh, I, I absolutely love this card. Now, before we move to Kohaku, the last one I want to call out is Bewitching. Mm. Um, so it's 3 XP permanent asset, exceptional. Reaction, before you draw your opening hand, search your deck for three different trick cards and attach them to uh, face down to Bewitching, shuffle your deck. Mm. Reaction, when you engage an enemy, exhaust Bewitching. Either draw one attached card or search the top nine cards of your deck for a copy of, of attached card and draw it, shuffle your deck. Love it. Fantastic. I'm going to coin the term here. It's trick to the plan. <laughs> trick to the plan. Nice. I'm sure no one else has come up with that very low-hanging fruit <laughs> joke. <laughs> Maybe not yet. <laughs> also, okay, uh, super quick. I'll pay uh -huh. you back. Hilarious card. Yes. Basically so fast. Good. Take all the money from someone else. At the end of your turn, you give it all back. But that can offer some really cool plays, both for mm -hmm. either giving you a bunch of money to play something big or giving them your money that you've created. To like, Imagine having just like a million resources at a rogue and you've got your whole board set up and you don't actually need them and you have ways to generate more. And you go to a guardian and be like, here's 14 resources. And they're just like, sweet. This turn I spend 18 resources putting out all these giant assets. Like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just really cool. So good. T terrible solo card. <laughs> all right. So then we'll move on to the purple cards. Yeah. We've got Kohaku Narukami. He is the folklorist. So he's got four willpower, four intellect, three combat, one agility. Feels like a trap. It's fine. Uh, scholar, blessed, and cursed trait. Reaction, at the start of your turn, either add one bless or one curse token to the bag, whichever there are fewer of. In a tie, you choose. Or you can remove two bless and two cursed tokens from the chaos bag to take an additional action this turn. Um, and then his elder sign is plus two. You can add one bless and one curse to the uh, chaos bag. Six health, eight sanity. 30 deck size. Blessed cards, 0 to 5. Cursed cards, 0 to 5. Occult cards, level 0. Mystic cards, 0 to 3. Oh. And neutral cards, 0 to 5. And he's got his, uh, yeah, his Book of Living Myths, Weeping Yuri. Yep. Um, so Book of Living Myths, as I mentioned. Clutch, always go get it. Uh, Chronicle of Wonders, 2 cost, Willpower, Intellect, agil or, uh, Wild Icon. Item Tome, Blessed, Cursed. Kohaku deck only. Reaction, when a chaos token would be revealed at your location, exhaust Book of Living Myths. Search the chaos bag for a bless or curse token, whichever there are more of, in case of a tie you choose, and resolve it instead. And then it takes up a hand slot. Hmm. Then we've got Weeping Yure. Uh, Yure? I don't know which. It's the weakness enemy. It's got two fight, two health, two agility. It's got aloof, elusive, and hunter. <laughs> That's a very, very annoying combination <laughs> of keywords. Yes, it is. <laughs> Prey, Kohaku only. Forced, after an investigator reveals a bless or curse token during a skill test at Weeping Yurei's location, if it is ready, it attacks that investigator once per test. And then runs away. And then runs away. <laughs> oh. 
and it deals to horror and it's prey uh kohaku only like it just it's what Mm. a jerk of a weakness i love it though (laughs) yes the good thing is it's it's a small one right like if if you have a guardian around like okay engage two Mm. damage you're done like it's when you even kohaku is pretty well positioned to handle this because Mm -hmm. well mostly because spectral razor exists and yeah among other things like among other things like you have plenty of access to things that can do two damage at a time it's just the elusive and the aloof that are going to add extra actions into into that sink yeah so so kohaku do do you have any experience any thoughts oh man i've been messing around with decks and like I, i think i've done two scenarios with them and one it like i think i did uh what do you call it uh, the one where you take two trauma and you get three XP. Uh, in the, in the thick, thick of it? it. Mm-hmm. Um, to grab favor of the sun and two favor of the moons? Sure. Or did I do two favor of the suns? I forget which, but either way, to get those cards in your deck at the start, and like then you can really control the tempo of the bag as far mm-hmm. as curses and, and blesses go. Um I think I love you it. would probably want more curses of the or not curses, uh, blessing of the moon, because you put you're pulling curses out of the bag and it's econ. Yeah, if I had to guess. Um, and then I love that he starts with four intellect because as a solo investigator, I can work with that right mm-hmm. from the beginning. Right, um, makes him significantly better. Yeah, I think it's going to take me a long time to figure out. I don't want to say what the ideal build is, but what like. What's the strong build? Where's where's the the juice coming? You know. Yeah. And I can tell you that, for you non cowards out there, the <laughs> uh, the paradoxical covenant build, I think it holds promise. The one I started with, like I said, didn't necessarily take all of the best cards for it. It just took all the new cards that worked with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is cool. So especially with uh, between the blessings and that you mentioned and the book of living myths, you can really dial in an auto success most turns mm-hmm. at your location. Yeah, I. Uh, and, I know, did that's the par- not that's not nothing. I did the paradoxal covenant uh, build for a nineteen XP deck with him, Ooh. and that thing sings like i i felt once i got to about 12 15 xp Mm -hmm. the the rest four or five xp was just like icing on top Mm -hmm. 19 xp you can get a really reliable bag control icon or sorry token grabbing thing going so Mm -hmm. well and prior to uh parallel wendy i don't know if there's anyone that could access the suite of blurs cards that kohaku could and like even wendy i don't think is she zero to five of both uh you if can you choose, choose both you can choose one or the other or both oh you affects, can do both okay yeah and it affects her deck size okay well she's parallel so it barely counts is she only uh-huh. to, f- to level four though oh i can't remember actually now Despite how much e- I've, I've played with her. I mean, either way, like, yeah. this is a really cool way to just, just look at the entire breadth of blurst cards that exist. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be so many different variations on how you fill the deck out for Kohaku. Yeah. And I think that is so cool. And then on top of that, you get all the mystic stuff for token manipulation. Just, mm, I love this investigator. My first run with him was not the best because... Mm. Th- Again, agility kind of gets punished in, in Hemlock a decent amount. Uh, but the the promise is here, and I'm very excited to continue building yeah. for him. I actually do love that he does have a dump stat. I'm not I'm not doing Agreed. the the agility dump stat meme. Like I no. do I really do like his his spread. Mm-hmm. He can handle like a small rats or something, right? Um, sure. On his own, and he's also got four willpower. I mean, I, I always wish it was five, but that's it is what it is. <laughs> As you do. Um, but that, that four intellect, I love it right off the start. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, any purple cards you'd call out? Let's, uh, I mean, let's, I love... let's get the mask out of the way, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's get the mask out of the way. So the cat mask is the capricious meddler. One cost. We're we're dealing with uh, willpower and combat on this one. 
and it replenishes after you replenish two of the two offerings after doom is placed on a card with no doom. I need and to revisit Amina. Yeah. So Amina is is one that I look at. Um, Akachi Lily. This is really decent in Lily. Oh, and uh, what's her name? The um, Marie. Mm, yeah, definitely Marie. Yeah. The Just interesting the thing about this is you can trigger this more often, the replenishment, if you're actually playing with Doom on your own cards. And even just mm-hmm. playing around with it a little bit, you'll get some mileage out of it. But if you just put this in any deck, every time an agenda is fresh and gets its first Doom, this gets recharged. So, like, you'll just you'll get those no matter what. Or an Acolyte so, comes in. Yeah, 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 for sure. There are any of the any of those enemy cards that that puts Doom down. Yeah. So this one's way more passive, I think, unless you're actively playing with Doom. But also, you're getting willpower and you're getting combat. Yeah, I mean, part of me wishes that was intellect, but I I appreciate combat. Yeah, for, for a cat. Yeah, I mean, I would have been fine if they just said plus three willpower and no other stat. Also, <laughs> sure, sure. So me too. <laughs> I'm I'm just looking at the willpower really. For uh, for mystics at least. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the. The glow up that read the signs got the leveled up one, uh, as well. Oh as yeah, because read the signs needed a glow up, but also spectral razor. Like those oh, two, yes. like the the riders that got put on them. So they got, mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure, extra icons or whatnot, uh, two XP, and uh, so it's basically if a symbol was revealed during this investigation slash this uh, attack, attack, return X card to your hand at the end of your turn. So you get read the signs or spectral razor back. Um, Sean, right. what do you think about uh, succeeding a whole bunch, or sorry, uh, revealing a symbol because you will have favor of the moon or favor of the sun out, and then being able to spectral razor something every turn? Mm, it's so juicy. Mm-hmm. It's so juicy. And with ethereal weaving in this set too, which is essentially like play three spells at once. Mm-hmm. Uh quite quite good i i really think that the next build that i try for kohaku is going to be like the like the non-mystic build where you know the classic mystic build you've got your movers and shaker assets in your arcane slots and that's how you get your things done um Mm -hmm. like a really spell event heavy mystic deck seems very interesting to me yeah maybe kohaku's not the one to do it out of but with his blurse access he gets he gets access to a decent amount of other ones out of class. Yeah. One thing I've been thinking of is making a essentially um, Flexi Mateo deck with uh, these two cards. Read the signs, Spectral Razor. Because he can take a bunch of Blessed, and then you just basically pound the bag full of Blessed, use Favor of the Sun when you're using Read the Signs, Spectral Razor, and you're just going to play them over and over and over again. So good. Um, I think the one card that I kept looking at and really wish I would have taken earlier in the campaign is the Key of Solomon, mm. Secrets of the Unknown. Uh, level four, two cost asset. It's got uh, willpower, intellect, and two wild icons. Item, tome, blessed, and cursed traded. Squiggly boy, if there are more blessed tokens than cursed tokens in the chaos bag, remove a blessed token from the chaos bag and exhaust the key of Solomon. Heal up to two damage and or horror from an ally or investigator at your location, mm-hmm. which is exactly how you want that to read. Yeah. And then if there are more curse than blessed tokens in the chaos bag, remove one curse token from the chaos bag and exhaust the key to gain two resources. It's like really punk, uh, packing a lot of like marginal effects into a single hand slot. Mm-hmm. And you take this into investigator who is going to be dealing with a blurst bag, which is what you do. Mm-hmm. Like this is good. You, you're triggering one of these two abilities every turn. Yeah. So good. I guess, uh, I, I guess unless the chaos bags at a tie, because this one doesn't say like, if it's a tie, do something. These are straight up. If there are more one than the other. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, that was one of those cards where I was like, oh, I've been looking at this all campaign. I really should have just taken it. I uh, 
I really like Speak to the Dead. Mm. The uh, So Speak to the Dead, it's a mystic asset, one cost, willpower icon, uh, talent and ritual traded, and takes up an arcane slot. Uses six offerings. Action. Spend any number of offerings. Parlay. Choose a spell or ritual event in your discard pile and reveal tokens from the chaos bag equal to the number of offerings spent. If at least one skull or curse token was revealed, return the chosen event to your hand. Um, so if you have Favor of the Moon out, it's basically spend one offering, get a spell back. Mm-hmm. Seems fun. This I'm is... not sure about the action economy on it and all that stuff, but... I mean, if you if you have a weird moment where you, you're playing those leveled up ones and you manage to actually put it in your discard pile, you'll be glad you have this. Yeah, and I mean, if you think about it as far as like if you if you do have favor of the moon out, and you use this as an action and spend one offering in favor of the moon, it uh, it's basically like action draw a card, but you're choosing a card you've already played and you want back. Yeah, seems really good. I mean, obviously, we, I got I to gotta throw one out to my, my girl, Olive, who got a glow up, who now yes. reveals four tokens. And she t- choose two. I'm not good at chaos bag math, but that seems really good to me. And it was. That was I upgraded her in my Kohaku build. And it very much helped co- uh, Paradoxal, Paradoxical Covenant fire mm-hmm. more often. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, the, oh God, there's so many cool Mystic cards. Mystic's got the coolest cards. I don't know if they're the best cards, but they're the coolest <laughs> cards. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. Um, I want to talk about the Rod of Karnamagos, Scepter of the Mad Seer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there's like six cards in seven if you include the leveled up one. I'm not going to read them all because we're we're trying not to be like super long winded here. But the idea we're feeling is at that, that, by the way. But yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and we're skipping so many. Imagine how we used. Oh to Oh my this. goodness, yeah. <laughs> So uh, it's, a, it's a hand asset. You put it into play. Um, free action. You reveal five random chaos tokens. And if a curse is among them, you get to put into play a rot card. Mm-hmm. And the rot cards do things like um, prevent the enemy from attacking. Or let's see here. What is it? When the enemy is defeated, you get uh, resources equal to its health. Or At the it, end of the turn, it, deal the damage. Yep, and it's yep. just all these really cool things. It's a free little action, cheap little hand asset. If you're playing Curse and Mystic, this goes in. This mm-hmm. just goes in, and it's really good and yep. quite fun. Oh, And also, I don't know if it was uh, Duke or Nick or a combination of both, but the fact that Scarlet Rot made it in, I uh, don't think that Elden Ring reference escaped me, and I love you for it. Yeah. No, this this is a blast of a card to play. Love it. And the difference is level zero brings one of those in randomly, whereas level two, you get to choose it. I mean, I think level zero is fine at level zero. Like Level it, zero is more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it is more of a slot machine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is very nice to be able to tailor which one you're pulling for the correct enemy, but like at level zero, two cost and just a free action, even mm-hmm. getting a random one still feels good. Okay, so here we go. Uh, Curse Duke... The dog, not the uh, inv- uh, designer. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, Pete can discard a card to ready the rod and do it twice mm. per turn. Spare the rod, Duke. Yeah, spare the <laughs> rod, Duke. <sighs> I want to know how you're going to fit a deck's worth of curse play into five splash slots, but I'm I'm loving the idea. Well, what's the what's the neutral card that's like put? Three bless, three curse in the bag. Draw a card. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, tempt fate. Yep. And then there's this is limit one per deck. So now you just need four other cards that add curses. It's all good. It's Got all it. Good. Got it. What's the priest of many faiths? Oh no, he's level one, isn't he? Correct. Oh, darn. Yeah. Anyways, multiplayer. There you go. That's the that's the ticket. Oh, right, there we go. Yep. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to the best class. All right. You want to read uh, Hank Samson? Sure. I'll read Hank. Hank's the farm hand. He's got three willpower, one agility, five combat. Th- oh, sorry. Three willpower, one intellect, five combat, three agility. He is assistant and warden traded. 
you may be assigned damage or horror dealt to ally assets. Uh, sorry, ally assets or other investigators at your location. When you would be defeated, sorry, reaction, when you would be defeated by damage and or horror, instead heal all of your damage and horror and swap this card with its bonded resolute version, either side face up. And then his Elder Sign is plus one. This first version of Hank starts with five health and five sanity. We'll get to the bonded version in a second. Um, deck building is a uh, deck size 35 which I'm honestly a little bit confused on, but maybe we can flesh that out. Uh, we get we get survivor cards, level to five, neutral cards, level uh, zero to five, and then up to 10 other innate and or spirit cards, zero to two. And then deck, deck building is stout hearted, where's paw, and one random basic weakness. So moving on to... And then reaction, when one or more damage is placed on you, gain two resources. Elder Sign effect is plus one. Move one damage from Hank to an asset you control. And then the other side, and the then. assistant <laughs> side, <laughs> yeah. has assistant and resolute traits. Now the stat line really moves. We get three willpower, three intellect, four combat, four agility, four health, six sanity. Oh, no, no. I, shit, I don't know if I mentioned the, the warden side has six health, four sanity. Um, and then, uh, when one or more horror is placed, so, sorry, you still can't be healed. When one or more horror is placed on you, draw a card. And then the elder sign effect is move one horror from Hank to an asset you control. Moving to his, uh, his signature cards. We've got stout hearted, which is a two cost event. We've got willpower and a combat and a wild it's a spirit trait fast play when you engage a non-elite enemy move up to two damage and or horror from hank to that enemy as damage oh yeah and then where's paw is our signature treachery revelation discard cards from the top of the encounter deck until an enemy is discarded attach where's paw to that enemy and spawn it at a connecting location of fable attached enemy gains elusive Forced at the end of the round, Hank Sampson takes one direct horror, which is kind of like scary. Feels like a Wendy card. It does. It does a bit. Yeah. What have I done? Okay. <laughs> There's <laughs> so many words to say about Hank. Do you know what I love about you? You know why Survivor is my favorite class? Because, because the investigators feel so wildly different. Yes. <laughs> because every one of them is just bonkers wild. Not every single one of them, but like just like Mystic, you do willpower things. Survivor, you mostly do investigative things. Survivor, mm -hmm. who knows? <laughs> Question mark? Yeah. <laughs> Profit? Yeah. Fun bullshit? Mm-hmm. So, all right. So first off, we're we're talking about like kind of deviations from like the the conventional deck building design and investigator design. Mm -hmm. Hank is like Exhibit A. Mm -hmm. he's even on his farmhand assistant warden side, the base side that you start on, he's already got a stat boost, right? Mm -hmm. He's three willpower, five combat, three agility. Really, really workable stats. Mm -hmm. He can be assigned things. That's fine. He's got five and five health. That's fine. Like, depending on what side you flip to, you're, you're looking at, like, 11 and nine overall health. Yeah. And the only downside to that is that you can't be healed when you're on your more powerful side. Mm -hmm. Which we can talk about things that can get around that, including the uh, 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 stout hearted that we just talked about. Yeah. But the thing that really confuses me if I'm being honest, is the deck size of 35. Normally, yeah. normally that is reserved for investigators who have some weird draw mechanic or whose signature is a cantrip uh, or or like just something weird like that. It kind of seems a little out of the blue with Hank, and I'm, I'm kind of curious what precipitated going from 30 to 35 there. I don't know if I'll ever get an answer, but... Yeah, I don't know. Like, part of me wonders if... 
I mean, some people will disagree with this, but I think a tighter deck, like a, a smaller deck size, is innately stronger because you're going to draw the cards, your best cards, sooner, right? Like, they're just math with that. Uh, and 35 is just enough to maybe weaken it a bit because I, I feel like he is very strong because mm-hmm. he lives twice, essentially. He lives twice. Even on his good side, even on his like pre-transformed side, yeah. his side before he goes, ha ha ha, you fool, you haven't seen a fraction of my real power. Mm-hmm. He's still really good. Yeah. Like, I have Hank is the other uh, investigator I'm playing across from Kate in my second Hemlock campaign. There was a game where I just never needed to flip him. <laughs> like mm. he just worked on his base side. Yeah, and I, I kind of assumed, oh, there's gonna be a moment where like the damage or horror comes and I'll flip him, but it never did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so no, he's uh, he's bonkers good. I I feel like Pete Sylvester is also one of the best allies he can have. True, Pete and uh, Jessica. If you just charisma Pete and Jessica, you're just mm-hmm. invincible. Yeah. Now the interesting thing is, I also really really love when uh, multiplayer mechanics come into play. Mm-hmm. With the <laughs> to post the Obi Wan gift, yeah, <laughs> become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Um, uh, I, I do love him being able to like straight up tank, and yeah. you know, I know like there have already been like six billion decks published on Arkham DB called Tank Samson. What about Hank is... the Tank? <laughs> Hank the Tank. Yeah. Thomas the Hank Engine. Or. <laughs> uh thank samson <laughs> thanks what can i say except thanks samson <laughs> <laughs> anyway i really like that that ability to tank for other people on that first side and it also gives you a lot more um uh, it gives you more of a like a tactile feel on when you flip mm-hmm. not so much in lower player counts but like if you're going higher player counts this is really good. And it gives you that moment of like, all right, this is the moment where I can like fully maximize my extra health. You were dealt one and one. Here we go. That, that covers it. Let's Mm -hmm. flip. Talking about the other sides. So if we consider that base Hank already has a stat boost from like the normal number of stats you get, Mm -hmm. then he gets even beyond that with his other two versions. Yes. He goes to 14 total He stats. goes to 14. We yeah. have our first printed six in the game, which, yeah. you know, isn't there from the beginning, but it is still a printed six on an investigator card, which is mm-hmm. monumental. Um, and, like, that version of him is really good. You get the extra willpower as well to just be even hardier and help hopefully protect that smaller sanity pool. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you get resources for your trouble. Mm-hmm. So that, think, one's, that one's really easy to clock, right? Like, that's killer. That's, yeah. you're, just, you're just going killer, you're hardy, and, and that's what you do. I do find the assistance side, the three willpower, three intellect, four combat, four agility, that one's a bit weirder. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it does offer you, when you take a horror, you draw cards, mm-hmm. which I tend to value slightly more than resources. Agree. Because um, card draw can get you resources. It's true, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's a weird like I feel like I would go warden almost all the time. Like I'm trying to think of a time I would go to the assistant side, which is the Yeah three three four four. I'm... Because if my starting stats are three one five three, why wouldn't I go to four one six three? Mm-hmm. Like I've probably built my deck around that. That's that's my thought. The only argument I have is true solo. And that's that's the only place where if you're if you're spicy enough to decide that hey I'm gonna take a one printed intellect investigator yeah. into true solo and fucking figure it out and you know mm-hmm. one of the ways you figure it out is you flip to assistant side yeah that seems okay it's still mm-hmm. you know I used to rag on true solo Mark I actually think true solo Mark is pretty doable like he's got enough he he's is. got enough sh- he's got enough shit available to him and he's got the Sophie stat boost. Mm-hmm. True solo Hank has to be a feat, even above that. Even with the assistant side available to you. I think with what Survivor has available, 
God, yeah. It's tough. Because, like, yeah, you can you can hop into that and, like, just kind of fail a bunch and, and use survivor fail shenanigans to, to be okay with it. Mm-hmm. But you're still doing true solo with a one intellect investigator yes. until you flip. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I don't know. You think you think I have a hard time because even in a situation where I'm thinking like, OK, I'm building a, a, a Hank deck where I'm using agility and evading a lot to do mm-hmm. weird agility and evading things. Mm-hmm. I'm still looking at the warden one harder than I'm looking at the, the assistant one, even with the boost, because it's not like survivor is bereft of ways to get you extra agility or extra evade, you know, effects. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's weird. And yeah, maybe you have an interesting idea for what you might use assistant Hank for call into the mythos busters hotline at two Oh three, four, nine, three, six, nine, eight, four. Maybe in true solo, you you hope you get your grave digger shovel and whatnot, like your sure. automatic clue discovery stuff in the beginning, mm-hmm. and then when you've burned through all that and you have, I don't know, cards in your hand, you switch to the assistant one, and now you have intellect icons that you can use to get clues maybe, <laughs> to, to get to a place where you can pass the test. <sighs> it's weird. It's weird, and the it fact is. that he only ha- basically has survivor access he's got innate and spirit i mean i yeah i haven't it's, built for him yet but i i need to look at what he can get as far as that for clue tech yeah it's it's just it's interesting and i'm sure there will be people who who come out and have like decent ideas for it of course but like and i don't even consider myself too much of a power gamer but if you're taking an investigator who starts in enemy mode right like mm-hmm. base hank says i kill enemies yeah and then you split to either i kill enemies better or well now i'm kind of passable maybe at getting clues yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there are very few situations where i'm picking that second one um it would almost be more interesting if he if he start well i mean i'm not going to redesign a card i just i don't know i'm, I'm kind of curious what you might do with the assistant side yeah all right, what are your red favorites, Scat? All right, I've got uh, basically two glow-ups. Um, mm-hmm. Keep Faith and Token of Faith mm. are my two big ones. So Keep Faith went to uh, 2 XP and 0 cost, because I believe it was 2 cost. Uh, and now it's Correct. same thing, fast, play during any Zavi Boy window, add 4 bless. I think Love I got it. a willpower icon too, or something. Yeah, got a willpower icon. Uh, and then Token of Faith, uh, it is a survivor asset, two costs, willpower, intellect, icons, item, charm, blessed, reaction, after skill test ends in which one or more curse or tentacle tokens were revealed, exhaust Token of Faith, add that many blessed tokens to the chaos bag. If this skill test failed, after resolving all effects from the failed test, the performing investigator may attempt that test again, max one per turn. So, same amount, uh, so same cost, uh, you get a willpower icon, and basically now you get a redo of the test for 3 XP. It's live is, and learn on a stick with bless. Yeah. And, and it makes your next test easier. Yeah. I think it's really good. At, it, at 3 XP, this seems really good. Yep. I will also never not love this art. Yeah. So good. So let's let's get the mask out of the way. I actually think the survivor mask is pretty solid. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's the Sparrow Mask, the Wanderer's Companion. Uh, this one has willpower and agility, and you replenish one of these two offerings when after you take one or more damage and or <laughs> horror. Which, if you're playing Arkham Horror, the card game, you'll probably be doing. Yeah. And uh, I think this one's good because it gives you those defensive boosts to get either willpower or agility, which... Yeah, ideally will help you <laughs> block further damage and or horror when you don't feel like it. Really good in Calvin, as are many cards in this box, actually. Mm-hmm. I feel like Calvin actually got a lot of help here. We do I'm need to mention Calvin. Dark Horse. <laughs> yes, we do. Dark Horse, Fuck. Dark Horse. <laughs> he, 
He rides across the nation, the thoroughbred <laughs> of sin. Um, so five XP permanent. That's all that's changed. Well, yeah, limit one five per deck. XP and permanent. But this is oh my goodness, fantastic! I dark horse being permanent, I think really opens up now dark horse builds because dark horse all the like i i think i said this on an episode where i was talking about dark horse where when you build a dark horse deck you need the build you need the deck to be able to win without be without having dark horse out without being in yep, dark horse because mode. that will and has happened yeah you won't get dark horse until like, like the second last turn of the game now, at the same time, you want to build your deck to survive if Dark, Source is, Dark Horse is out, which is a very specific way to play. Mm -hmm. Now, you can just go full tilt Dark Horse. Yeah. Which I love. Now you just build any deck and, like, mm -hmm. you can just turn it on when you feel like it, when you're yeah. ready. Yeah. And there's so many cards in Survivor that are good in Dark Horse and that are also just good when they're there. Like Fire Axe and Mariner's Compass. Like, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Uh, one card that I think is going to get a lot of play um, because people just play Vicious Blow all the time because it's also really good is mm -hmm. Long Shot at level yep. zero. Yep. Um, so that's a skill test. You may commit Long Shot to a fight or evasion test against an enemy at your location or a connecting location. Mm hmm. And if this test is successful, deal one damage to that enemy. So I don't really know. There aren't. I can't think of too many situations where it's a big deal that this is itself its own little one instance of damage as opposed to adding to the damage from the attack. There are some things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think largely, on the whole, this is just long-distance vicious blow that doesn't have an icon. Yep. So this, this will see a lot of play. I think so, too. It, honestly, it's just a vicious blow without an icon. And it has the option of doing it at a distance. And it's like it, it, you can commit it to any test. And it, it's evasion, too. So you could yeah. put this in, say, Rita, and yeah. ping two damage off an enemy you're evading. Like, beep. Ooh, I did not think about Rita. Really good in Rita. Yep. Also, the art is pretty rad. <laughs> yeah. Bonk. Uh, I really like uh, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. It's a really mm. weird card to me. Agree. Uh, but it's a zero cost event. Uh, willpower, agility, and uh, wild icon. Spirit and double traded as additional costs. You got to pay an extra action. That's the uh, double trait coming into play here. Uh, move up to five damage and or horror from your investigator to assets controlled by investigators at your location. For each asset defeated by this effect, draw one card. Remove wrong place, wrong time from the game. <laughs> yeah. That's Scott. So do you cool. do you need that ally? Do 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 you, do you like really need it? Do I need that asset? Like various health soaking assets versus <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Like to me, this like what I was talking about, Calvin. This is a great Calvin card, right? Like when you're oh yes, your teddy bear and your leather coat are one away. Like this is like tons of card draw. Mm-hmm. Like, defeat this is those fantastic assets. in Tommy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, and I love the art, too. <laughs> like, yeah. He's up there painting the sign for Welcome to Innsmouth. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's corny as shit, but I am here for it. Mm hmm. Wouldn't you yep. rather, Scott, wouldn't you rather than have that asset that I draw a card? Wouldn't you rather? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Awesome green I just, card. I, it's, I think it's yeah. I think it's going to cause some very fun table talk. Yeah. That card. Okay, last one, um, super quick. Uh, hunting jacket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a two cost, two XP asset, uh, item, and clothing traded. It's got an agility icon. Uh, takes up the body slot, and it's uh, Zappy Boy exhaust hunting jacket. Choose one non weakness card in your hand and attach it face down to hunting jacket. Max three cards attached. Then gain one resource for each attached card. So it's gonna be six resources total. Uh, when hunting reaction, when hunting jacket is defeated, draw each attacked attached card. So you get a two health, two sanity soak for two cost, two XP. You're gonna gain six resources, and all it costs you is holding off on playing a couple cards. 
and then you're gonna get that back anyways really cool and like love it i imagine if there's a case where you're like oh shit i really need that card now like you could engineer it somehow right oh yeah also tommy tommy got a huge yes. set of good cards in this mm -hmm. pack Mm -hmm. This is exactly, exactly what Tommy wants, is, yeah. is extra card draw and resource, I guess. Yeah. Kind of more resource, like, while it's out, I guess. Uh, All right, touching on, you, you, got, you got any favorite neutrals? I do. Uh, I love Dawnstar. Oh, I was going to pick Dawnstar. It's so good. You know what's funny is, uh, is I have this giant list of cards. I think we've only actually picked, you've only picked three cards from my giant list. It's funny how wow. we have different interests. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dawnstar neutral event uh, one cost one XP wild icon it is ritual and blessed trade fast play after revealing chaos tokens during a skill test at your location ignore the modifiers on each uh, curse token revealed during this test for each curse token ignored deal one damage to an enemy at your location like this mm. just it's these cards that remember I hated curse Mm -hmm. so many ways to mitigate curse and so many yep. ways to benefit from curse more so than we had and now i'm a fan of curse and i'm so glad that they went back to the the bless curse thing yes. in this box and the fact that this specifically this specific thing that you were saying that helps people who were not like on the curse train yep. mitigate curse is neutral neutral so important one <laughs> so important one xp Mm -hmm. One cost. Yeah, it's fantastic. And it's reactive. Like, so, so, so many good things about this card. This is a huge boost to uh, to playing Curse. Um, I think the one I'll call out is the one I saw Justin use to great effect, and that is Eldritch Tongue. Oh, also on my list. <laughs> this is an Alessandra card. Yes. <laughs> okay, so and Alessandra is a 26-card deck. Yeah. Two Eldritch Tongue, two <laughs> Fine correct. Clothes. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so two costs, level zero, uh, has a willpower icon, ritual traded, uses four charges. You may play events with parlay from your discard pile as if they were your as if they were in your hand. As an additional cost to play an event this way, spend a charge from Eldritch Tongue, and after that event resolves, remove it from the game, takes up an arcane slot. Which in Alessandra generally are not like super contentious. Yeah, and as long as you aren't planning on looping your deck three times, like, I think the remove from game is just fine. It's absolutely fine and fair at level zero. <laughs> and also, I don't know if you saw this, Scott, but on the Reddit, I, th I want to say it was PAX, but I'm so sorry if I'm misattributing this. Someone posted a bunch of Photoshopped meme pictures of various Arkham investigators and art uh, uh, basically handing you a blunt or, or a joint mm -hmm. like passing to you and Alessandra's was far and away the best because she's got like that shit coming out of her mouth and like the other hand is photoshopped to show her just like handing you the joint and it's it's so good and I can never not see it now go check that reddit post out it's got to be buried somewhere in the the top uh, another neutral card that I think is just going to be an absolute mainstay in my four player killer decks is bide your time Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is a neutral event, zero cost, has a wild icon, which I always love these niche cards to have a wild icon. Mm -hmm. um, double traded. As an additional cost to play, bide your time, spend an action. So you spend two actions. During your next turn, you may take two additional actions. Sean, how many times have you been the killer at a table and there's no enemies and you're just like, I guess I'll just draw a card and gain two resources? All the times. Every game I've been a killer. <laughs> yeah, and then the next round three people draw enemies and you're like i have shit to do wouldn't it be great if you had five actions boy it sure would yeah boy Honestly, it sure will this might actually be a fantastic solo card because how many times are they like i just need to do this one thing but i don't want to advance quite yet but when i advance i'd love a five action turn or when you advance, or, or not even when you, like, that that's a really good one, but also there's that there's those situations where you have, like, an enemy in the location where you need to go in and do a bunch of shit. Mm -hmm. But, like, it was like Silas for a very easy example. Yeah. But, like, I don't have enough to get in, do the things I need to do, and get out in one turn. Mm -hmm. Really good for that. Also, Min can add a, an extra wild icon to it. 
I love uh, occult. You can say reliquary. that about every card. Yeah, I love occult reliquary. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Three XP permanent, uh, limit one per deck. You have an additional, additional slot basically that can only be used to hold a blessed or cursed asset, hand accessory arcane. But yeah, this was fantastic in my Kohaku build because there were so many things. Like my my slots were honestly kind of a mess, and this mm-hmm. saved it mm-hmm. because like no matter what, this spilled over into something that I needed to play down and didn't yep. have the slots for. This goes into my Blurse Wendy. This goes into my Bless Zoe. I love it. It's yeah. so flexible. Because a lot of times I'm taking the... Uh, oh, goodness. What is it? Oh, the additional asset one. Mm-hmm. Or no, sorry. The additional accessory. Oh, Relic Hunter. Relic Hunter. Um, but this one just offering hand accessory or arcane slot. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I like that we have an extra slot that is specific to Blurs. Yes. Normally, I'm kind of like, oh, all right, do we need to do this again on on these types of cards that kind of take they kind of take one of the the base uh, limitations of the game out of or, or they mitigate it at least. But this one, this one, I'm super OK with. Any others for you? Oof. I mean, so many. But I guess I guess I mean, I guess I'll, I'll talk about uh, well-dressed again. It's not blowing my mind or anything, but it is a very good Alessandra card. If you're playing parlay in your deck or, or planning to do parlay, mm-hmm. um, there are certain scenarios where this is really good, too. Um, so neutral skill has a wild icon, and when it's committed to a parlay test, or a skill test on a parlay action specifically, that does matter, I think. Mm-hmm. It gains three wild icons. Okay, so Alessandra so. has a 24 deck size. <laughs> <You take Yeah. laughs> it's getting smaller and smaller the farther we go scott yeah <laughs> you hit 30 real quick with alessandro yes, unfortunately you do. yes you do <laughs> but anyway it's not it's not like setting the world on fire but it is a really nice little level zero neutral card for a very specific type of deck and i mean good. if you build your deck the way you probably build it on 75 percent of your tests this is double unexpected courage yeah yeah i think they added enough bonus to it to make it good and you know what occasionally if you never see that moment where you need this it's still a wild icon so like it's good so wow (laughs) anyone else need a cigarette we've never done it that fast before what was that (laughs) where did that come from that fast we're at two and a half hours (laughs) Yeah, but we just did a whole cycle's worth of player cards, kind of. I mean, yeah. I mean, barely. Yeah. Uh, to that point. Love the cycle. We, yes. Yes. Very cool you know. cycle. We got we got uh, a re-up on Blurs, which is a, a mechanic that I quite enjoyed. And I'm very excited to see how much flexibility there is added now. Mm-hmm. Such and a, then, a fun oh, set. I, like, I just... Yeah. I love this set and having it with the bless and the curse. Like you said, re-upping that. Uh, I love all the bonded stuff. There's some super themey stuff and it's fantastic. So. Yeah. And not to make any mention of the campaign where the theme is really cool. Like I, we'll talk about the campaign at a later date. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really cool clutch clutch of cards. It was really cool to see uh, the first post MJ release come mm-hmm. out and you know I, I think in general be be really satisfying and cool so I'm, I'm very excited to continue to explore it and mm-hmm. if you dear listener are disappointed with how we didn't pour over every additional card please let us know uh if if there's enough people who say hey we'd love to see you do more more in-depth card reviews again we'll do that in in another format and you know what? If we do AV Club on on the Twitch channel, it'd be very easy to post that to the podcast RSS, so we could get it here mm-hmm. too. So, let us know if you have interest. Also, if Oof. you want to go off on your favorite card that we didn't mention, there's always the mm. uh, voicemail line. Just oh, saying, it's so there, it's so there, and we so want to hear from you. It basically forces us to talk about your favorite card. So true. <laughs> Two or three, right, four, nine, three, six, nine, eight, four. Yeah, or if you're on the Facebook page on your phone, you can just click call us. Hell yeah. Sean, tentacle time. What's been grabbing yeah. you? Yeah. 
Um, wow, I have so many things. We missed a month, and that was that was a big deal. And and now we're here, and so many things have happened. But the one thing I'm going to talk about is Star Wars Unlimited because it's a new Star Wars card game that just came out. So I'm going to collect it because do I've you like done Star Wars one. card games? Do you like I Star have Wars done games, Sean? every single one that I'm aware of. All right. Um, that that has released starting starting with Decipher's CCG. Do you have that really I weird do. Jedi one? Young Jedi? Uh huh. No, no, the one after that. Oh, Jedi Knight. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. With the with all the the CG images. Yeah. Yep. Weird. I got this really weird. I didn't collect it when it came out, but I did collect a bunch of it after the fact, and I got like these weird like day one printing versions of it that all have this like day one brand on it. It makes the card super ugly, but weird. I don't know. I uh, I, un- yeah. I understand why that game failed. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Star Wars Unlimited. I'm I'm only a little bit in about a couple boosters about a about a starter. Um, I managed to get the kiddo to open a bunch of boosters with me, and I hooked her on the gambling aspect. So at the very least, I think <laughs> I can good. get her interested in uh, in opening cards with me whenever I buy new things. And I think occasionally she'll play with me. Um, but it's it's a cool little game. I you know I don't know that I will ever have a, a Star Wars card game that comes out in my lifetime that really really captures the wildness of the CCG. Mm-hmm. I just I think that's a dragon I'll be chasing for the rest of my life. Um, so say what? Yeah. Well, but in the, in the interim with the one that we have, uh, I did really enjoy Destiny, and this really feels like all right we're doing Destiny again, but it is just a card game. It's it's a little destiny. It's a yeah. little key forge. It's a little magic. It's got it's got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I love how like quick and and kind of straightforward and fast the games are. Mm-hmm. Like really, most games you just kind of like ramp up to seven or eight resources, and then everyone brings out their big bombs, and you see whose bombs hit better in first. Yeah, it's really punchy. Um, it really, really is, and I like I I enjoy it for that. Now, on the flip side, because I am a salty bitch, there are some games where my deck does not pop and my opponents <laughs> do. Like, I met with Justin. Uh, we we played a game at uh, at a brewery, and he brought a double command Leia deck. And I was... So so the the main rare that I pulled that, I, that is of value, I think, is I did pull a showcase hero mm. um, from one of, my, one of my booster boxes, which is, like, the highest rarity in the game currently. Uh, and it's a Chirrut, a Chirrut Imwe from Rogue One. And his ability is really interesting, and I'm not good enough to build around it yet. So I I tried, but mm-hmm. Justin brought this really, like, solid, straightforward Leia rush deck and just, like, trampled me. So, <laughs> but the nice thing is, even if you're going to get your ass beat, that game's going to last 15, 20 minutes tops. So yeah. uh, really enjoying it. I I have thoughts. I do I do really miss... The LCG, because I feel like, for the most part, the art in that game was so good. It was. And on top of the art, the, like, corners of the expanded universe that existed Mm -hmm. at that time before Disney, like, nixed it all or, like, made it all nebulous or Mm -hmm. whatever. The corners of the EU that they poked into for that one were really cool. Like, we, we got... All of the named characters from Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight. Mm -hmm. And, like, I couldn't ask anything more of a Star Wars card game. Um, But we will see. We will see. Because that's that's really what I like is I like the the, on top of the Star Wars characters and and gameplay. I like to see that kind of, like, cool, obscure shit. So we'll see what they poke into with Unlimited. But, yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. Mm -hmm. I don't know how deep we'll get in. I cannot at this point see myself taking it competitively. Mm. but you know what's new yeah the thing that holds me back is i will want to go competitively (laughs) yes you will (laughs) i can't i can't afford that or the time and just yeah the random purchase is just something i'm not i'm not sure like i still play some magic like i play commander Mm -hmm. and i've made and i played magic way back in the day too the amount of packs i've bought just to open Mm -hmm. under five like either I'm oh, drafting wow. or I'm buying singles because the sure. randomness of drawing, I'm just like, why? Why would I? Sure. Why? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a thing for me. I've lived so long in the LCG sphere where everything's like upfront and civilized, mm-hmm. and you just get it all, and then you get to like spend all of your time 
playing with it instead of seeking it, mm-hmm. that 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 is a thing because I I got some I got most of the card pool with two booster boxes and I'm pretty happy with it. I didn't get full play sets by any means. Yeah. Um, but the one card that I was really hoping for that I didn't get a single copy of was the uh, Darth Vader unit, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, God. I, I like I'm gonna have to fucking have it, and right now yeah. they're going for like sixty seventy dollars. So I think what? I might wait. It. Yeah, I think I might wait a set or two and see if the price comes down. Yeah, because I I can't buy more than two booster boxes just for one card. I can't. I no. cannot do that. Well, okay. So here's the thing. What's a playset? Three cards. Yes. How much does a booster box cost? Uh, MSRP is one twenty. So let's say if you were like, oh, I'm going to buy like two booster booster boxes to get Vader. Yeah. You can that's just go buy three set of singles. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly at the point of where I'm at. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see. Yeah. Anyway, having a good time with it, playing with Justin a little bit, hoping I can get my kiddo into it because it is a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, more to come. More to come on that. Yeah. Scott, I know what's grabbing you. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, Liberty and Freedom and Managed Democracy. Uh, Helldivers 2 mm-hmm. is a game that I am playing <laughs> incessantly, and I love it. Um, it is a game that came out on PS5 and computer. I'm playing on, on computer. Uh, it is a third-person and occasionally first-person shooter where and it's co-op and it's up to four people and you go down to planets and you kill robots or bugs and the shtick that they have around uh you you are a citizen of super earth and you're trying to protect these planets and try to liberate them and it's just oh liberate boy. them by blowing up everything yes by blowing up all the things it's just the shtick they have is really funny um because same just, energy as starship troopers right yeah, Starship Troopers and also like Team America. Right? Sure, like, yeah. Um, but it just, it's so much fun. You call in stuff from orbit, like blasts and bombs and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it's cooperative and you do a lot of things and you shoot things. And I don't know, it's just scratching an itch that I didn't know I had or I knew I had. Not sure. It's blown it's my just- mind. It's a well constructed game, and I, I hate to be I hate to be a hipster about this because I love I love that Helldivers two has popped off like it has. Yeah, but like I played Helldivers one a decent amount with a bunch of friends, and like that core concept was really good. They mm-hmm. literally just took the game they had with Helldivers one, and instead of a top down twin stick shooter, mm-hmm. they turned it into a fully fleshed out third person shooter, and they did it so well. So um, the. I had never even heard of Helldivers 1. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't know it existed until I saw Helldivers 2. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it this indie game studio. This yeah, game they're blew, crushing it. Yeah, they it blew up on social media to the point where, like, they had problems with, like, servers and people logging in because they did not expect... I heard a stat, it's like 23 times more players in Helldivers 2 than Helldivers 1. Mm-hmm. Like, they were not prepared for that. They were not prepared for how well clips of that game would play on TikTok. Yes. And I, I that's reductive, but I think that's a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Because, like, just wha- random wacky clips of that game and how ridiculous it gets just, like, play so well in the short form format. Yes. And it pulled so many people in, and mm-hmm. it's, it's really cool. Like, there are people I... I Never thought I'd get to play this game with, or like, oh, did you hear about Helldivers too? Fuck yeah, I did. Yeah, let's buddy. go. We have you and I have yet to play, but hopefully we'll change that tonight. Hopefully, um, if anyone out there listening is playing, I have made a Discord server specifically to have friends show up and play Helldivers. Like, there's mm-hmm. two, like two or three channels, and it's basically like, hi, this is where we talk about Helldivers, and hi, this is where we plan when we're going to play. So. If you're out there and you're on Discord, uh, send me a message. I'll invite you. And it's just a place to, uh, you know, group up with people to uh, all jump. Defend democracy. Yes. Manage democracy. That word manage is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Spread manage democracy. Yeah. The bugs, they want democracy. Can't you tell? (laughs) They do. So do the automatons. (laughs) Awesome. All right. 
Excellent. Well, I think that's going to be well enough for us. Thank you for joining us uh, for episode 163 of Mythos Busters, and we'll catch you all next time. Thank you.